Hello and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. I am me, and this is my co-host, the other. Hello. And there are currently only nine other people in the world. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope you're all having a wonderful Friday evening, and welcome to our, our, our book club. Uh, I'm sure we know a lot of people there say, hey, I, I see some people I recognize already. We got Doom, Tringard, Not Not, and Kyrgyzstan. Hello, you folks. Uh, the rest of you out there, say hello, um, especially if you're joining us for the very first time. We want to know about it. So uh, so this, this is it. This is us. This is the book club. Matt, explain what a book club is once the again. Thing, the thing is... Uh... Each month, Scott and I select five books from a pool submitted to us from our wonderful Doof community, and then we set up a poll for all of the supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia and let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about. The book with the most votes wins, and then we all read it. That is right. And then here on the last Friday of the month, we get together and spend a couple hours discussing these books. We pull some slides with some interesting and or important moments, and we discuss them. We just try to try to get our brain around the book. We sit back in our comfy chairs and we drink coffee at 9.30 at night because, you know, that's what I do. Um, we're, we're, we're here to have some fun. Or water with some... magnesium in it. Just say it's vodka, man. Come on. Come on. Uh, Th- throw, me, throw me a bone here. It's a giant glass of vodka, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matt, uh, as everyone in the chat is saying, hello, why don't you tell us what book we're talking about this month? Uh, this month, the 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 uh, readers have selected Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Uh, the summary is as follows. Piranesi's house is no ordinary building. Its rooms are infinite, its corridors endless. Its walls are lined with thousands upon thousands of statues, each one different from all the others. Within the labyrinth of halls, an ocean is imprisoned. Waves thunder up staircases. Rooms are flooded in an instant. But Piranesi is not afraid. He understands the tides as he understands the pattern of the labyrinth itself. He lives to explore the house. There is one other person in the house, a man called The Other, who visits Piranesi twice a week and asks for help with research into a great and secret knowledge. But as Piranesi explores, evidence emerges of another person, and terrible truth begins to unravel, beginning at revealing a world beyond the one Piranesi has always known. That is a pretty good summary. Um, this book, of course, was written by Susanna Clark, who uh, we've covered on the book club before. About about this time last year, I believe, we read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, uh, Susanna Clark's only other novel. I think, actually, the way it lines up, Matt, I think we covered that book the same month that this book came out, or maybe like within a month or two, because I do remember, after loving that book, rushing out and buying this novel immediately and reading it uh, right away. Right, right. I didn't save it for any book club. I didn't. I said, screw it. I need to go read this book. That's how much I liked Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Um, but now I want to hear from you, Matt. What did you think of Piranesi? And I'm going to say it wrong every time because I don't know why I just got it in my head that Piranha and C, even though that's clearly not the words, but uh-huh. Piranesi. Just, yeah. Just remember it's, it's Italian. Um, I loved it. Uh, I also liked Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell a lot. And uh, this is just a delightful short novel. Mm-hmm. It's 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 the sort of it's the sort of book that I really love, where it's sort of contained and very very focused in on a premise, and and simple you know simple themes, simple ideas, small number of characters, focused on on you know individual struggles, not a whole lot of complexity really, uh, but just perfectly executed. Um, just a delightful experience all the way through. It's just, it's an absolute ride. It's one of those books where I got to a certain point and then I was just basically listening to it constantly until mm-hmm. I finished it. Yeah. Like I just, I couldn't put it down. Um, and I should also say the audiobook reader, Chi Hotel, um, is you for is just, uh, just a, a treasure. It's just I, so I, good. I can't, you, I think you just sent me like a, a screenshot of read by Chiwetel Ejiofor, and I was like, oh, holy shit. Like, that's awesome. Uh-huh. He's got such a great voice, and it, it just feels like it'd be perfect for this novel. So I'm a little jealous that you got to listen to it. Uh, but, it was uh, perfect, yes. Uh, it, I agree with your overall assessment, and it seems like everyone in chat is as well. Um, I adored this book. I think Susanna Clark is 
just an incredibly talented author. And I think the, the, the thing that I really want to spend a lot, not a lot, but a fair amount of time on tonight is kind of talking about the similarities and differences between Jonathan Strange and this book, because I think they are very different types of stories. They're doing very different things. In a lot of ways, the language is very different, but I, I think you can also very much tell that these are two books written by the same person um, with with a, a, just a talent for words. Um, mm-hmm. She's remarkable and yeah. And this is such a fun book. It, it like the the central mystery of it and the way it, it 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 slowly kind of reveals itself to you is so entertaining. But you're also there's a lot of beauty, and then there's a lot of I think there's a lot of deep stuff going on at the core of this book that that Susanna Clark is is exploring. So uh, wonderful book, one of my favorite books that I read last year. So glad we get to really talk about it because I've been itching to talk about this book. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we get to talk about it too. I'm, I, you know, I think I, I just experienced it in that in that kind of full full bodied present way where I wasn't really being very analytical as I was reading it. I was mm-hmm. just I was just there, like it was a thing that was happening to me. And so um, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't really like intellectualized much. So this will be an interesting conversation. Sure, sure. Yeah, I I, I mean I've been thinking about it for a while, so I I think I have some some grasp on on what i think it's doing and and why but i'm not even i'm not even 100 percent sure on that and that's kind of the one of the things i enjoy most about the book is it doesn't it doesn't really spell itself out for you in the end Mm -hmm. um there's there's the story and it's not even uh, god it's such an interesting story structure overall you know like we learn who this guy is and we learn how he got to this place and we kind of we kind of sort of learn what the place is but like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell like the 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 magic that exists in the world is kind of just there to help you know talk about these people and mm-hmm. and what's going on with them and I I don't know I just it's, I god I loved it I loved it this is such a fun book yeah yeah uh yeah everyone else is is agreeing with us um Dan says that it reminded them of of Everlyn Hardcastle, at least in terms of the diction. I think I could see that. Um, I think like the the this is such a, a unique point of view character in general, and I think we're going to talk about that in our very first slide. The idea that he is a very smart, capable, intelligent person, but he also comes off very childish because um, because of his ignorance to you know the 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 quote-unquote real world right yeah Um, well that it's a sort of purity like that 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 to me is one of the most almost kind of like pleasant and and escapist elements is that your your protagonist has this like childlike innocent purity which um is is kind of refreshing (laughs) in a certain way i mean most books are about terribly flawed people um, and you know, he has a flaw, which is his memory is messed up, but he's, he's also sort of nearly superhumanly perfect because he, he isn't tainted by the world. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of really interesting comments. People apparently really like this book cause there's yeah. just a lot of people in the chat talking about that makes me happy. Um, comparing it interestingly, you know, Kirkistan has a, has a comparison to the, the beauty of the house is similar to the, the way it uh, Mars is described in Red Mars. It's just kind of loving descriptions. Um, yeah, um, that's interesting. interesting. I, I want to. I definitely want to talk about that. Um, oh boy, um, people are talking about the cover image here on the slide, which you also took. Uh, we had the same clever idea, which is actually we're both kind of cheating. This has nothing to do with uh, Piranesi, the book. Damn it! I did it again. I think <laughs> I think I've actually convinced myself. That the way I was saying it before is right, and that's the correct way. Piranesi uh-huh. is uh, this. This image has nothing to do with Piranesi, the book. This image is actually from Giovanni Piranesi, who uh, was a um, Italian architect and also created uh, etchings of things called uh, mind prisons, which is which is actually why which is why the other which is why Ketterly has named uh, uh, this character. Piranesi because he's a fucking asshole and yeah. he th- thought it'd be funny to name the character that so I think he's... it's funny that like I, I we didn't talk about the fact that you were going to put that in your background and I was going to use that as the image but that's that's just what yeah. we kind of did well I mean the, the thing is there's not really any fan art of the book Piranesi and that's then, true you know, so I just grabbed a bunch of of Piranesi's drawings which you know it, it is funny because most of his drawings have this sort of um uh, uh 
this tone of like oppressive doom and and Mm -hmm. um uh it's like uh, it's like disconcerting you know Mm -hmm. uh whereas that's not like the that's not at all the tone of this book actually the 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 house um you know the infinite labyrinth is actually beautiful yeah and um well, I think that all comes down to perspective. You know, I mean, like, mm-hmm. I think I think Ketterly looks at this place and looks at it as oppressive and maze-like and terrifying and um, just wants to solve it. And and Piranesi looks at it as this beautiful thing. So he didn't yeah. call himself that. Ketterly called him that because that's what he sees when he looks at this place. And I think yeah. that that perspective and that fear versus beauty um, and goal-oriented versus chill is, I think, very core to what this book is doing. Yeah, and I think he also sees Berenice as being in, in, trapped in a mind trap. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But, um, I really, I, I we can, we can go ahead and start with the slides. But one thing I really want to talk about first is is this idea that like honestly, I I read this book a year ago, and when I was thinking about it again before I started it, I had turned Piranesi into a child in my head and then I was very quickly reminded in the book I was like oh no no he's a, he's a full grown adult and I still even while I was reading there were times where like I magically transformed him back into a kid and I think it's a lot of that has to do with the the fawn imagery and the fawn being his favorite statue which links directly to to uh to Chronicles of Narnia um mm-hmm. this is like the yeah. the third book in as many months that has been a direct reference to <laughs> to Chronicles of Narnia um, but I, I don't know. I think it's really interesting. And I think it's because of just, it's the style and the tone of the way she writes from his perspective. Like, like I said, he's a very intelligent, very smart, very resourceful person, but there is a lot of, I think just s- frankness and earnestness and, and honesty and, and s- simplicity of his existence that just makes me, makes my brain transform him into a kid. And I don't know, I don't know if I'm the only one <laughs> who is doing that. I didn't see, I didn't see him as a kid, but I was surprised when I learned that he was like thirty something. Yeah, mid thirties. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think I thought, you know, I, I sort based on some context clues from the books he was reading, I was like, oh, he's like graduate student age. He's like early twenties, and it's like, no, he's not. He's a, yeah. He, he's mid career actually. Mm-hmm. Um, Mary in the chat says that uh, she thought that maybe he had a, he had Alzheimer's and, and was lost in his own mind, which yeah. Um, that's so interesting. It almost makes me wonder if it's like a metaphor, you know. I, um, I I'm gonna say this. We we can get into this as we go. I I do think there's a lot of mental health metaphor going on in this book for sure. Mm-hmm, um, yeah. I think the house as a symbol of your brain is a is a very good one, and I think that's there. There's definitely a lot a lot there for sure. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh let's get into it. And we can keep keep the conversation rolling. Let's do it. So we begin with the opening of the book, as always. When the moon rose in the third northern hall, I went to the ninth vestibule to witness the joining of the three tides. This is something that happens only once every eight years. The ninth vestibule is remarkable for the three great staircases it contains. Its walls are lined with marble statues, hundreds upon hundreds of them, tier upon tier, rising into the distant heights. I climbed up to the western wall until I reached the statue of a woman carrying a beehive 15 meters above the pavement. The woman is two or three times my own height, and the beehive is covered with marble bees the size of my thumb. One bee, this always gives me a slight sensation of queasiness, crawls over her left eye. I squeezed myself into the woman's niche and waited until I heard the tides roaring in the lower halls and felt the walls vibrating with the force of what was about to happen. First came the tide from the far eastern halls. This tide ascended the easternmost staircase without violence. It had no color to speak of, and its waters were no more than ankle deep. It spread a gray mirror across the pavement, the surface of which was marbled with streaks of milky foam. Next came the tide from the western halls. This tide thundered up the the westernmost staircase and hit the eastern wall with a great clap, making all the statues tremble. Its foam was the white of old fish bones, and its churning depths were pewter. Within seconds, its waters were as high as the wastes of the first tier of statues. Next came the tide of the northern halls. It hurled itself up the middle staircase, filling the vestibule with an explosion of glittering ice-white foam. I was drenched and blinded. When I could see again, waters were cascading down the statues. 
It was then that I realized I had made a mistake in calculating the volumes of the second and third tides. A towering peak of water swept up to where I crouched. A great hand of water reached out to pluck me from the wall. I flung my arms around, around the legs of the woman carrying the beehive and prayed to the house to protect me. The waters covered me, and for a moment I was surrounded by the strange silence that comes when the sea sweeps over you and drowns its own sounds. I thought I that I was going to die, or else that I would be swept away to unknown halls, far from the rush and thrum of familiar tides. I clung on. Then, just as suddenly as it began, it was over. Okay, so lots to talk about here in the beginning. I, I think one of the things I want to start with, Matt, is our introduction to the halls is one of danger right like mm -hmm. like th this is the this is the opening of the the story and we are seeing right here that this is a massive you know converging of tides that is creating this massive flood that our main character almost miscalculates and drowns but is but is saved um by by the kindness of the statues and i i, I couldn't quite fit it on the slide but i like the very end of this where he like opens his hand and finds a piece of marble statue in his hand um, that like that the 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 halls gifted to him, um, which is a great showing how like all these things happen and he just thanks the basically thanks the world for it. he thanks existence like like mm -hmm. in his mind everything that happens here has a has a consciousness and is alive and and protecting him and providing for him in some way, but it is interesting that like the first thing we are told about this place is it's dangerous like we see the danger right here like the, things get violent and yes we're told specifically this this particular thing only happens once every eight years but like it, it's a hell of a tone to start you off with like look at this beautiful beautiful place oh but it's very it's very dangerous and you could die here very easily yeah but at the same time i think that we are given evidence through repeatedly throughout the book that the house is actually watching out for him in some sense yes yeah C communicating him in these sort of pre-rational magical ways um and uh, uh he is the beloved child of the house indeed as we mm -hmm. will see yeah um, the other thing people are already talking about in chat is the thing I wanted to talk about with you, which I think was probably lost on you in the audiobook version. But this book has a style in which common nouns are capitalized constantly uh, mm -hmm. throughout the story. Um, you know, I think I, it was so funny. I was talking to my sister who was reading this book and she said it was driving her crazy and she didn't understand why. And like, I had forgotten that that happened. Cause I think what happens is you just kind of, you, you notice it at first for sure, but you just kind of get used to it. Um, I, I think this is really interesting, but, and I think this ties to, I think this ties to Piranesi's view of the world. Like, it's not like his choice to capitalize these nouns makes them proper. Right. And so it's not just a tide. It's the tide. It's this right. tide. It's yeah. like, and, and that's everything. Everything in this world is the one and only example of that thing. This yeah. is the legs of the woman carrying the beehive. So that's it. That's, that's what's here. This is the familiar tides. So we're going to capitalize those. Yeah. It's, and, and it's such a, it's such a fun and interesting stylistic choice to make to really, you know, almost immediately as soon as you start reading, sell his commitment and his commitment to the place and his love of the place, but also his lack of understanding of anything outside of the place. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's some c comparison to be made to the idea of the, pl the platonic realm. Yeah, the, the platonic realm of perfect forms where the mm -hmm. statues are the forms. Yeah. Um. And, you know, and, and everything in the house is is the the version of that thing. Yeah. And, you know, the things that we encounter in the world are the the lowercase manifestations of those things. And sure. So sure. Yeah. That, that, that's that's what I jump to immediately is is just like, hey, it, it's this is the this is the ultimate and the only one of these. Yeah. <laughs> e even if it's something as mundane as as foam, I think this place to him is is this holy um realm mm -hmm. where where even even the things that are common in midday like like you know birds and stuff are are part of of just this grand um perfection and uh deserve deserve to be capitalized yeah yeah and no, i think you're right just just so <laughs> the timing is clear i think you said you said the phrase platonic forms like the second miss evil doom sent that message there's a little <laughs> bit of delay between the stream and the chat so it's it's very funny that happened almost simultaneously no one will be able to appreciate that but me as i watched it happen <laughs> but uh that was great that was great i think it's i think it's a fun touch and i think 
you know, I, I one thing I didn't pay enough attention to is if it fades over time as he kind of discovers Matthew Rose Sorensen a little bit more. I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but I thought it was such a wonderful, like, st- differentiating statement to start your book with. Yeah, maybe we can keep track of that as we go through the slides. Sure. But no, that that's you know, I mean, there, the, like you said, danger. It's funny because there's so little of what you would typically think of as action in this book. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but it, it begins with this moment of danger, and you see that the house is dangerous, but um, but it also is take it takes care of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I, I mean, this is of course like the the opening scene is a flood, and then we see that our big our big the only kind of action climax that exists in this book takes place during another great flood yeah uh, but let's move on to our next slide and let's talk about our other person who is aptly named the other second person the other i estimate the other's age between 50 and 60 he is approximately 1.88 meters tall and like me of a slender build he is strong and fit for his age his skin is a pale olive color his short hair and mustache are dark brown He has a beard that is graying, almost white. It is neatly trimmed and slightly pointed. The bones of his skull are particularly fine, with a high aristocratic cheekbone and tall, impressive forehead. The overall impression he gives is a friendly but slightly austere person devoted to the life of the intellect. He is a scientist like me, and the only other living human being, so naturally I value his friendship highly. The other believes that there is a great and secret knowledge hidden somewhere in the world that will grant us enormous power once we have discovered it. What this knowledge consists of, he is not entirely sure, but at various times he has suggested that it might include the following. 1. Vanquishing death and becoming immortal. 2. Learning by a process of telepathy what the other people are thinking. 3. Transforming ourselves into eagles and flying through the air. 4. Transforming ourselves into fish and swimming through the tides. 5. Moving objects using only our thoughts. 6. Snuffing out and reigniting the sun and stars. 7. Dominating lesser intellects and bending them to our will. The other and I are searching diligently for this knowledge. We meet twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays to discuss our work. The other organizes his time meticulously and never permits the meetings to last longer than one hour. If he requires my presence at other times, he calls out, Piranesi, until I come. Piranesi, it is what he calls me. Which is strange, because as far as I remember, it is not my name. Um, <laughs> it's great. I, I love this so much. Like you can tell already, just how strong the style is here. Yeah, and it, it it's so fascinating to me because the the view of Perinaisi is such a con- like constricted, like limited view. And so, like the first time you're reading this book, you're really confused because, like, we've just been told he lives in this limitless, infinite hallways with you know millions upon millions upon millions of statues he like fishes for his own food like he he's he's sleeps in an alcove like and then here's this guy and he just without any thought beyond it describes him as freshly shaven you know wearing a suit like Mm -hmm. very clean and composed and you're just like wait (laughs) wait (laughs) wait wait yeah. And and of course he doesn't question any of this. He's like it's just he's just so matter of fact about it. So so matter of fact and there and there's no questioning of anything. I mean there were so many times where I was like, "Hey, Piranesi, what's a meter?" Yeah. Yeah. What's a Tuesday yeah. or Friday? Like <laughs> like like why do you know what these things are? Right. And you know, who 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 gave birth to you? Like like the basic questions that you would think they just they never occur to him because the house sort of well, I mean, won't let him. Basically, it's, mm-hmm. it, it's keeping him in this state of just, this is the house and this is where I live. Yeah, and, you know, and it's it's so interesting to me because like, a, just like from a third person point of view, his existence seems miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, but because we're in the first person point of view, it never seems miserable. Like, yeah, he seems totally contented. He seems like the most contented person in the world, even though he's you know having to catch his his water using plastic sheets to catch rainwater and. Uh, and so on um so that that's uh, i don't know that's it that's a persistently fun aspect of the story is is his l- lack of ability to notice these contradictions and yeah. then eventually like very slowly c- kind of beginning to put some things together but in a way that's very believable and fun i, I love the parts where he's like already started to realize that it doesn't make sense that he knows like what a university is Mm -hmm. and he's like well naturally it's the statues i've seen a a statue of a scholar so obviously i understand where a scholar comes from and it's just like "Mm, 
that doesn't really check out, guy. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, th- I mean, that's part of the fun of the book. I think the other part of the fun of the book is because for, for the majority of the first half, at least, this is the only other point of contact he has. And I think we, the reader, get to see almost immediately that this guy is manipulating and abusing Piranesi and he's just completely ignorant of it. And that's, I think, part of like part of the, the uh, I don't want to call it pleasure because it means like I'm enjoying this guy torture him. I, no, I'm not. But like mm-hmm. the, the the part of the the fun of reading this book is is kind of being a little bit more in the know. Like it, it it's really interesting to me how Clark dangles truth in front of you while also you have no fucking idea what's going on for three fourths of this book. Yeah. Like you just have no fucking idea. But then she's like dangling things right in front of you, and you understand. Like yeah, that you're you're that you're right, Susanna. That doesn't make any sense. But what yeah. does it mean? It's it's like partial dramatic irony mm-hmm. because because at a certain point I think you do figure out you figure out well before Piranesi does that oh this you know this guy is just from the world and mm-hmm. this is a secret pocket dimension that you can access via certain meditative practice Mm -hmm. um and 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 the clues are there well in advance of that like i mean i don't know i just it's just so funny to me because you know out of out of these things that he lists as as potential powers we have learning by telepathy what other people are thinking Mm -hmm. um dominating lesser uh dominating lesser intellects and it's like there's only if there's only two people in the the world (laughs) Why would you want those powers? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, isn't that um, what Piranesi says? He's like, I don't really care about this stuff because what am I going to do with that? And yeah, then he's like, yeah. flying through the air. Like, I feel like the bird. That's for the birds to do. That's not. That's not for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it is. People in chat are talking about how the powers are like very childish. Like the, the, it, uh, it's it's almost like a kid wishing they were a superhero, right? And that is that. That's really interesting because. This is all, like he's he's transcribing them here, but this is kind of coming from Ketterly. This is kind of what Ketterly wants. This is this is the his obsession with this place and and why he kidnaps Matthew Rose Sorensen in the first place is to to see if he can investigate to find out what the stuff is. But it's all very nebulous, right? Like it's not even a specific targeted goal. It's just like uh, we're gonna find like some thing and then it's gonna unlock the thing. And I love like there's a whole portion of the book where he makes. Uh, Piranesi like walk three hours out to a west thing where you can see the stars from that particular hallway to do some sort of ritual to do what <laughs> the book keeps all that like very nebulous and and like we it's not it's not the focus of the story but it's like what what were you go what what what, what, did, what, what did you think was gonna happen Ketterly like what what is what is the ideal oh. perfect result of this thing for you yeah, I mean, my, my interpretation of all that was that Ketterly wants earthly power. Like, he wants... Uh, honestly, I connected a lot of this to the, to, to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Not that I'm saying it's the same universe, but there's similar ideas where he wants he wants earthly power. He wants mm-hmm. magic powers. Yeah. He, wants, he wants to be, you know, a demigod on Earth. And, and the fact is, this magic, you know, these magic realms do exist, um, but they, they aren't what he wants them to be. What the, They... You enter them. You enter into them on their terms. Yeah, yeah. And and it's like in a certain sense, this is the vibe I got by the end of the book. Anyway, Piranesi is a, a, a magically empowered human. He sure. has powers. He has he, he he has. You could say he has powers over the house, but from his perspective, the house just takes care of him and and get and provides for him because it loves him, um, which is probably more accurate anyway. And 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 uh, uh, Ketterly is incapable of, of seeing that. He wants to control it. it uh, yeah. it's a very rational mindset, very top down mindset. And I think that's why the the tides and it, like the book opened on this these incredibly powerful tides, you know, coming in and washing everything away. And this idea that in this world, in this place, like you you got to go with the flow. <laughs> yeah, like the, the idea that you can come into this place and control it and seize seize it and make it yours and bend it to your will no you can't that's not that's not the way this place works and and i think the the water is such a great a great metaphor of that and of course it is those ti- those very tides that that undo ketterly in the end yeah i love the water as a metaphor particularly because 
Piranesi is able to figure them out. Um, yeah. Where and and Ketterly just sees them as as random and and chaos and uncontrollable. Mm-hmm. And Piranesi is just like, no, nah, I mean, I've I've calculated exactly what they're gonna do. And yeah, I, the, the way I assumed is like he's only able to calculate that in the first place because the house kind of nudges him into realizing that it can be predicted. Mm-hmm. I, I like this. I like this uh, view you have of the house as, I mean, obviously, yes, the house is magical, but I, I like this view you have of that, that this magical house is actually like consciously taking care of him in a way. Uh, I'm not sure I had that read when I read the book. I just, I, I, I went through a very kind of mundane he he is able to survive here because he is kind of has has become one with it and gone with it in a way and 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 learned it and appreciated it in a way that allows him to see the bigger picture and and see everything and understand everything and and so survive but uh Mm -hmm. i I like that idea that there's much more much more direct magical influence going on here yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe I just want to feel that way because it's kind of it, it's a it's kind of a happy thought to imagine that the, the house is actually caring for him and loves him, mm-hmm. um, whereas it, it seems a little bit sadder to imagine that he's just deluded, and you know when the birds fly around and he deduces some kind of message from the way the birds are landing on the statues that he's actually just literally psychotic, you know. Um, <laughs> I don't want yeah I I, I, I don't want to say that. I just think like. I don't know. You're absolutely right. The birds that could literally be the house talking to him, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or he could just be like processing his own internal thoughts through what the birds are communicating yeah. to him. Well, I, I connected the bird idea to the idea that uh, uh, humans used to used to be uh, pre-rational, you know, pu- purely in a state of sort of dreamlike consciousness, and that gave us access to to other worlds mm-hmm. and. And, and and part of part of that idea is the idea of like reading the future in entrails or tea leaves or whatever or the or the movement of, the movement of birds literally, um, yeah. And and so he's he is he is in this pre rational state. That's how he is able to avoid noticing all of these weird coincidences and 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 things. He's he's not putting things together in that way. And and so he's able to just look at the movement of birds and be like, so they flew to that statue and then back to that statue. And does that mean? Um, you know, and, and then and then he he deduces something, or or maybe it just kind of goes into his brain, and then he forgets about it. But then it leads him to make the right decision later. <laughs> you know, it, it's all it's all very like um, subconscious. Uh, I think. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, I like that. I like, as Kirkistan says, I think it can be a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want to even argue for one side or the other. I just think it's no. Uh, yeah. That's why I wasn't saying I disagree with you, Matt. I was just like I hadn't considered it from that angle. Um, I, I went much more mundane with it, but I, I, I was first of all I was I forgot the scene with the birds, and second of all I just uh, I, I just I like I like that view of it for sure. Cool. Um, before Shall we move we? on, I just want okay. I just want to comment on on Michael's comment here. <laughs> it's hard not to look at the commentary about how Ketterly wants to solve the house, while Piranesi knows you should just appreciate it and not think about the cinema to, cinema style analysis of media yeah i think there's i think that's that's a good take i think there's a lot of that going on of like you look at this you look at the the art right the house is art there are the marble statues everywhere there's columns and stairs and 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 beautiful everything's beautiful and you want to what does it mean what is it for you know why why this why and and like that 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 style of i need a definitive answer and i need a definitive value out of this thing is is absolutely what i think some of what this book is doing yeah the the, the conch symbolizes order um <laughs> but, sorry. just gonna keep bringing that one back i keep bringing that one up matt um, said that yeah. one in a, this week's episode of of kingslingers if you're not a listener yeah. of that show. i was i was complaining about like overly didactic literal interpretations of mm-hmm. metaphors in, mm-hmm. in fiction yeah yeah all right all right let's next talk about, week speaking of the statues let's talk about those statues yeah there are some statues that I love more than the rest. The woman carrying a beehive is one. Another, perhaps the statue that I love above all others, stands at a door between the fifth and fourth northwestern halls. It is the statue of a fawn, a creature half man and half goat, with a head of exuberant curls. He smiles slightly and presses his forefinger to his lips. 
I've always felt that he meant to tell me something, or perhaps to warn me of something. Quiet, he seems to say. Be careful. But what danger there could possibly be I have never known. I dreamt of him once. He was standing in a snowy forest and speaking to a female child. The statue of a gorilla that stands in the fifth northern hall and always catches my eye. He is depicted squatting on his lower limbs, leaning forward and propping himself up on his powerful arms and fists. His face fascinates me. His great brow overshadows his eyes, and in a human expression, his, this ex, in a human, this expression would be called a scowl. But in the gorilla, it seems to me an exact, the exact opposite. He represents many things, among them peace, tranquility, strength, and endurance. There are many others that I love: the young boy playing the cymbals, the elephant carrying a castle, the two kings playing chess. The last I will mention is not exactly a favorite. Rather, it is a statue, or, to be more exact, a pair of statues, that never fails to arrest my attention whenever I see it. The two, the two statues flank the eastern door of the first western hall. They are approximately six meters tall and have two unusual features. First, they are much larger than the other statues in the first western hall. Secondly, they are incomplete. Their trunks emerge from the walls at their waists. Their arms reach back to push mightily. Their muscles swell with the effort, and their faces are contorted. They are not comfortable to contemplate. They seem to be in pain, struggling to be born. The struggle may be fruitless, and yet they do not give up. Their heads are extravagantly horned, and so I have named them the Horned Giants. They represent endeavor and the struggle against a wretched fate. Is it disrespectful to the house to love some statues more than others? I sometimes ask myself this question. It is my belief that the house itself loves and blesses equally everything that it has created. Should I try to do the same? Yet, at the same time, I can see that it is in the nature of men to prefer one thing to another, to find one thing more meaningful than another. God, I love this book. It's, Me too. it's so good. So good. Um, yeah, I mean, let, let's get the obvious out of the way. The dream of the fawn with the little girl in the snowy forest is obviously a, a lion, the witch, in the wardrobe reference. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting that he calls this his favorite statue of the fawn, yeah. which we're, we're told specifically is uh, a, a being made to be a reference to that novel, which is a story about people entering a portal into another world which is exactly what happened to him i mean maybe there's maybe there's a i think there's a lot of subconscious stuff going on here there's a lot of uh a lot of the sleeping matthew rose sorensen sorensen mm -hmm. like in in his love of these particular statues right and i think that the fawn is definitely the, the one of them for sure yeah yeah absolutely i had the same exact thought where it's it's the, your subconscious is telling you that you're in a you're in another world man yeah but yeah that, that's never gonna it, it's he's so far from being able to realize that on his own yes she to, to answer not not's question does the youngest girl meet tumnus first yeah uh she goes the first time we just watched this movie for doofcast not too long ago uh, i can't remember her name though what is the youngest child's name is it lucy lucy yes thank you uh the first time lucy goes into narnia she goes by herself runs into tumnus they uh they have a nice chat and then uh he tells her he's supposed to kidnap her but he doesn't want to and he lets her go yeah and then the boy comes back through and betrays everyone yep edgar <sighs> edgar yeah there's <laughs> always a there's always a bad kid yeah uh, but I mean, it's not just the fawn though. I love, I love the description of this, the, the gorilla, you know, I love that, um, the, like in the eyes, in a human, this person would expression would be called a scowl, but to a gorilla, it seems to mean the exact opposite. I love that. I love that so yeah. much that like, it, it, it's, it goes to show you, I mean, it, it feeds into this general idea of, you know, perspective on things like yeah. it, would uh, someone else would probably see that and and see it even in a gorilla as a scowl if you try to anthropomorphize an animal you would see that as them scowling at you yeah. but there's it's such a fun device to have the statues you know yeah. I, I lost count of how many descriptions of statues that we got More, it's very yeah. interesting because they they almost never have a real direct plot relevance no no it's it's always just like a, a lovingly beautiful description of a of an object which brings with it its own kind of mood and tone and and um feeling and and then maybe Pyrene it sparks some thought process in Pyrenees yeah you know which which you can view as being kind of like the house is is helping him along in, in his thinking by sure drawing his attention to certain statues I, I you know again it could be 
it could be just him making connections on his own. In any case, I, I just I love the device because it's it's not like the you know. It's funny. I never actually thought this was going to happen, but it just occurred to me like you know maybe someone could start this book and imagine that like there's a part where the statues come to life, um, and that and that their their traits would actually matter. But no, their traits never matter. Like it never yeah. matters that that's a fawn. It's literally just the symbolic meaning of a fawn. Yeah, I mean the symbolic meaning, you know, both doylistically and Watsonian, right? Mm-hmm. Like like they they mean something to us, the reader, but we see directly here that they mean something to Piranesi as well. Like like he says here, like the gorilla represents peace, tranquility, strength, and endurance. And that's what the gorilla represents to him. That's what it means. And I think that is another thing that like, you know, Ketterly goes into this place and he sees a statue of a gorilla. Piranesi goes into this place. He sees a statue of a gorilla and he's, he, he, you know, it, it's back to our interpretation of art, right? He sees this art, this 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 representation of something, and it means something, and he, he pulls meaning from it, and and that is that is, you know, something that none of the other characters seem to do, um, with with one other with one exception, and we'll get to her. Um, yeah, they they seem to just be kind of terrified of the statues, terrified of the water, just just confused and and not open to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's interesting because. You know, as far as like, I think Miss Evil Doom brings up something really, really interesting here. Like, I assume that the things Piranesi thinks the statues represent are objectively correct, where the house is meaning and thought made concrete. Which I, I think you're, I think you're right. But like, but like, who's who's meaning and thought? You know, like, like, and how does that work? Because obviously, this place existed before Piranesi was here. Um, so like. I, I guess I, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get too literal with it, you know. I'm trying to get too, like, too specific with it that like that that these things can just have always existed and are just representative of things that that exist mm-hmm. in our world. I mean, we get we see that directly at the end where he starts seeing people and statues and statues and people. Mm-hmm. Well, it could be it could be the Platonic ideal of the idea, or it could be a specific idea that some specific person had. We don't really know. Sure, um, I kind of like not knowing. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm not saying I wish. Yeah. I'm definitely not saying I wish they had. They had really nailed that down for us. No, not, yeah. absolutely not. Mary says, you know, uh, depictions of art in fiction are powerful for drawing meaning and enhancing our enjoyment of a story. And and yeah. I was I was thinking while while talking about the statues about like, um, in in the in Ward, the the book that we did a, a whole podcast on. There's a character, the main character will will look at people's superhero costumes, and and analyze them. Um, and, and, and there's always like reading meaning into the costume and then also kind of projecting her own feelings about the person onto her criticism of the costume. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I just, I think that this is a, a fun, a fun literary technique is actually to have your character observe some piece of art or in that case, a costume, um, which is a kind of art actually, and make inferences and make, and make, you know, uh, interpretations and all of this, because it tells you, it tells you a lot of information on kind of a back channel about like what your character's thinking and yeah. the way the world works. It's such a fun device. I think you're right. And, and th- like, I love that. Like, I, I, I wonder, like one of the questions I'd ask Susanna Clark, if I could, is like, what was your, what was your first initial idea in this book? Like, like did, were, was the statues, was the statues the first thing, you know? Cause it's, it's one thing to say, I'm going to make a book about this character that gets trapped in another world. And I'm going to use this for, for metaphors of, of mental health and, and, you know, all these other things. And then to also go, okay, also this place is going to be absolutely stuffed with infinite statues. And I'm going to mm-hmm. use the statue as a representative, a metaphor for people, uh, emotions, places, things, experiences, everything. It's, it, the statues are going to represent everything. The statues are everything. And so I'm going to use a, a form of artwork, a very popular form of artwork throughout history to, to represent everything Mm -hmm. um it's such a fun idea and and i don't know like it's because statues are there's something about statues man they are fascinating they are kind of like they're a big deal to us because like they draw your eye they're designed to draw your eye right and it just like the i it's always fascinating to me because like the ideal of sculpting something out of like i just i have no skill in that regard and i don't even fully understand how people do it like i just don't get it i just don't get how some people sculpt 
the level of detail they're able to sculpt. And so yeah. like just a statue is just, I, I love one of the, the, my favorite things about visiting old places is looking at the statues they have. Cause it's just, man, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Have you ever been to like Westminster Abbey in, in mm-hmm. yeah. London? Yeah. 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 That's, that's the first place that I think of where it's just, it's just absolutely stuffed with these statues where any single one of them, you would just be like, that's the most, I can't believe that's real. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I certainly can't believe it was made, you know, hundreds of years ago or, or whenever it was from. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, no, surely that is 3D printed. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the only art forms where you're just, you're, you're almost just stunned when yeah. you see it. You, you, you don't believe it. And I, and, and you, it's just so, it's so fun and mesmerizing to imagine a whole, you know, enormous, maybe actually infinite, um, world yeah i guess full of them and i mean okay i'm gonna say this as a person who is not a sculptor and knows absolutely nothing about sculpting but i'm making assumptions about a lot of things i think the idea of sculpting a statue uh, you know there there is a lot of talent to it and there's a lot of calculation and consideration but i think a lot of it is kind of you just have to roll with it as well right like because especially with the kind of tools that people were making statues with hundreds and thousands of years ago, right? Like the, the rock doesn't always quite break where you want it to. Like you can, you can try to manipulate it as, as finely as you can, but sometimes a crack's just going to break or a weakness in the structure of the stone is going to break it a little bit a different way. And you kind of just have to allow the sculpture to work with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great metaphor for a lot of what's going on in this book. A lot of the ideas of this book that you just kind of like, you can't, you have to work with the material that you're being given. And and maybe, you know, maybe Piranesi himself, you know, is is a better piece of stone than, um, than some of the other people who, who have, you know, tragically been killed by the house. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, it's funny. I'm thinking about. I, I had the privilege to see Michelangelo's David, which mm-hmm, is mm-hmm. The, the first thing to mention is that it's like three times taller than you imagine it to be. Yeah, it's huge. Um, it's so huge. But the, the the other thing about it that I remember, I think this is correct, is like the pe- the the giant piece of marble that it's made of was actually this like, not quite a reject piece, but like it was an imperfect piece. It was a weird shape, mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, Michelangelo was able to. Um, take advantage of that basically like like he 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 knew how to make the statue that he wanted come out of that piece even though other people might have not wanted to use that piece it's it's Um, god it's it's fascinating i I love this i love this line of conversation i never really thought about statues in this way but uh evil doom is saying they're kind of one of the most physical art forms It, it, it that art that exists in the same space you are it's like the closest a piece of art can be to that person like because they're they're there it's not Mm -hmm. flattened it's not transformed into two-dimensional space in any way it's it's yeah and i think from my perspective like i've seen a lot of famous art pieces you know in my life so far paintings are beautiful and i love looking at paintings like I, i love going to museums and looking at paintings but like i feel like the Mona Lisa being the greatest example of this paintings always kind of disappoint Mm because you've kind of built what it must look like to see it up in your head. And then it's just at the end of the day, it's just a thing on a canvas, you know, Um, with some exceptions, but like sculptures are the one thing that has always been more impressive than the pictures I've seen of them in, Mm -hmm. in real life. Like that just like, and I think that has to do with the, the, the third dimensionality of it, you know, like this idea that like, yeah, I can look at a picture of Michelangelo's David a hundred times, but to see it, to see it, that's yeah. way different than than looking at Starry Night or, or Mona Lisa, you know. Yeah, just just <laughs> another cool thing about statues is, you know, <laughs> the, so so like the Romans probably had a pretty advanced um, portrait painting technology, but we don't have any of their paintings because that would nothing survives that long. Sure, paint doesn't survive that long. Yeah. But we have a ton of statues. Like we have marble busts of Julius Caesar. We know what Julius Caesar looked like. That's fucking wild. You know, and and so like that's um yeah exactly <laughs> like, that's crazy right. <laughs> so, so like it's it's such a it's such a um amazing amazing technology for preserving like yeah what a thing actually looked like and then that's just gonna stay that way unless somebody actually smashes it. Yeah, I I, I like. I like what Dan is saying. We can't forget the statues were all painted too. Like we have in our mind that like 
ancient Rome had just had these these beautiful you know marble white statues everywhere. It's like no 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 they were they were slinging paint all over those things. Yeah. Of course they were. They were uh, probably painted really really well too. Yeah um, yeah I'm sure they were. Yeah. Why don't we paint them anymore? That's an interesting question, Dan. And I think it probably has to do with a lot of Renaissance obsession with uh, Roman and Greek statues that just made the assumptions that that's what they looked like off the assembly line. You know, they came out looking like that. And so we styled a lot of our our architecture and our artwork based off of a wrong assumption of what those things actually looked like. Yeah. Also, I would answer, we do paint them. We just paint really, really small statues. (laughs) That's lame. (laughs) (laughs) He's talking about like Warhammer shit, folks. That's what he's he's talking about. Didn't see that I held up my fingers to uh, indicate the size of these. (laughs) statues all right let's let's that's enough statue facts with scott and matt which is funny because i don't even know if anything i just said was a fact it's just a a feeling yeah it's entirely possible that (laughs) that everything i just said is wrong (laughs) um anyway all right um should we move on where were we i don't even know where we are anymore uh we are on slide six oh this is where we get our first real hint at the world outside of the quote-unquote labyrinth as it's called The first vestibule is an impressive place, larger than the majority of the vestibules, and more gloomy. It is dominated by eight massive statues of minotaurs, each one one approximately nine meters high. They loom over the pavement, darkening the vestibule with their bulk, their massive horns jutting into the empty air, their animal expressions solemn, inscrutable. The temperature of the first vestibule is different from that of the surrounding halls. It is several degrees colder, and there is a drought that blows in from some draft that blows in from somewhere, bringing with it a smell of rain, metal, and petrol. I have noticed this many times before, but somehow I always seem to forget about it immediately afterwards. Today, I concentrated my attention on the scent. It was neither pleasant nor unpleasant, but extremely interesting. I followed its path. I passed along the southern wall of the vestibule until I came to the two minotaurs that flank the southeastern corner. Here, I noticed something. The shadows between the two statues were producing a sort of optical illusion. I could almost imagine that they extended backwards a long way, and that I was in fact gazing into a corridor leading to a distant point, where there was a patchy patch of misty light. This patch of light contained other lights that seemed to flicker and move. It was from there that both both the, the draft and the scent seemed to emanate. I could hear faint sounds, a sort of vibration and a dashing noise like waves, but less regular. Suddenly, I heard footsteps, followed by a voice loud and indignant. Not what I was hired to do, and I said to him, You have to be joking. You have to be fucking joking, mate. Another glummer voice said, People have no shame. I mean, what goes through their heads when the footsteps died away? I leapt back from the southeastern corner as if I had been stung. What had just happened? Cautiously, I approached the statues again and peered between them. The shadows now looked unremarkable. I could sort of see how they might suggest the shape of a corridor, but that was all. The cold draft played around my ankles, and I could still smell rain, metal, and petrol. But the lights and the noises had vanished. Hey, Piranesi, how do you know what gas is? Yeah, yeah. How do you know what that smell is? Yeah. <laughs> Did you stop to think about that, bud? No? No? Uh-huh. Didn't? No? Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it never, pretty rational, childlike. Um, uh, you know, it's funny because when you're reading, you're, you're not actually annoyed by this behavior. It's just, it's just. No, no. It, it's you, fun. You, it's actually fun, I think. It, it's fun, and, and I think you know that this is going to resolve. Yeah. Like, like you know that this book's not going to end with him not having gotten some understanding of what's going on or, sure. or things coming to a head in some way. Sure. So, I mean, but this is really interesting, right? Like, first of all, it's called the first vestibule for a reason because it's the place he came in. That's why it's called the first one. So that's what – and he, he never right. stops to think about that, that, like – why is why is the yeah. first vestibule different from all the rest? I don't know, man. What, yeah. what do you think? Where does your numbering convention come from? Yeah. Well, there's the whole. I mean, it's the, the book makes it very clear how blocked he is on this because yeah. he has he literally has the journals full of the information that he needs. That yeah. if only he were to read it, um, but he just doesn't. No. Doesn't look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I also really like the detail that like the the entrance to the house aka the labyrinth is <laughs> there's minotaurs here like mm-hmm. someone has a sense of humor that maybe perhaps the house itself has a sense of humor here that this mm-hmm. labyrinthian house is guarded the entrance is guarded by a bunch of minotaur statues mm-hmm. it's really it's really great or or maybe the the person who made the the myth uh found this place that you know 
could be could be yeah. no it, it's very it's very cool I, I i've been i've been trying to restrain myself from making this comparison but i'm, I'm going to say it anyway it's it, it, this whole book felt very much like the video game mist there i said it um uh, because it's well, number one it's a story about like doorways to other worlds and sort of creepy manipulative dudes in those other worlds mm-hmm. trying to get you to do stuff for them yeah um, yeah yeah i wonder and, i wonder if Susanna clark has played has played the mist i i kind of i kind of bet she has actually but but i don't know not not certain um i wonder if anybody else got that vibe yeah have, have are we are we just the oldest like certainly certainly some of y'all in chat have played have played mist right we're not we're not fully out of that out of that Kyrgyzstan is mad at me for spoiling the the 1990 uh one or i want want to see if you get this right i'm looking it up right now i would say i would guess 90 actually no Uh, no 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 92 92 you were close you were close what is it uh uh, oh, I thought you were saying it was 92. I'm it was 1993. 92. September okay. 24th, 1993. Okay. My guess was 92. You know who owns Mist? Microsoft. Activ- Activision. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Microsoft. Yeah. Microsoft now owns Mist. So was, it's it's back, baby. The only other option was Disney. So <laughs> So you didn't actually know that. You just were making a making an educated guess on that. Yes. I mean, I mean pre-rational um um, covenant with the universe, and I'm just guessing things, and, I'm, remember, and, I'm, and I'm right. Y'all remember Zork? Remember the Zork games? Love me never, some Zork games. I never played Zork, but I know what it is. The first ones were just text games. Remember when games were just text? I do. It's the good old remember, days. I used to play this Wheel of Time mud. You, you know what a mud is, Scott? I do. I never played one, but I do. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing. Is that it these though? existed? I mean that they existed. Yes, it's amazing. Is the game amazing? Well, they're they're actually surprisingly cool considering the the bare bones technology they were based on. Like yeah. you you could do quite a lot of stuff and it worked surprisingly well. I'll, I'll put it that way. That's fair. You know, I never beat Mist. I we'll we'll beat get Mist off either. this topic in a bit. At, but I I could never get through that game. This this game is uh, this book that we're talking about is putting us in this like liminal space rationality is making it difficult to stay on topic i'm blaming the book everyone's calling us old and I, we're moving on we're moving we're on moving on we're moving on all right um we did we freeze in the, in the youtube or is that just my never mind we're I fine think it's just you all right um we we are blah 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 blah, blah. we are slide seven and yes. that is piranesi oh he piranesi meets the prophet mm. the, th- the the third person in the world who is going to tell him and mainly us about what is going on here. Tell me, he said, does Ketterly still think that the wisdom of the ancients is here? Do you mean the great and secret knowledge, sir? Exactly that. Yes. And is he still searching for it? Yes. How amusing, he said. He'll never find it. It's not here. It doesn't exist. I was beginning to wonder if that might be the case, I said. Then you are a good deal brighter than him. The idea that it isn't hidden, the idea that it's hidden here, I'm afraid he got that from me too. Before I had seen this world, I thought that the knowledge that created it would somehow still be here, lying about, ready to be picked up and claimed. Of course, as soon as I got here, I realized how ridiculous that was. Imagine water flowing underground. It flows through the same cracks year after year, and it wears away the stone. Millennia later, you have a cave system. But what you don't have is the water that originally created it. That's long gone, seeped away into the earth. Same thing here. But Ketterly is an egotist. He always thinks in terms of utility. He can't imagine why anything should exist if he cannot make use of it. Is that why there are statues? I asked. Is what why there are statues? Do the statues exist because they embody the ideas and knowledge that flowed out of the other world into this one? Oh, I never thought of that, he said, pleased. What an intelligent observation. Yes, yes, that is highly likely. Perhaps in some remote area of the labyrinth, statues of obsolete computers are being are coming into being as we speak. He paused. I must not stay long. I am too well aware of the consequences of lingering in this place. Amnesia, total mental collapse, etc., etc. 
though I must say that you are surprisingly coherent. Poor James Ritter could barely string a sentence together by the end, and he wasn't here half as long as you. No, what I came here to tell you is this. He wrapped his cold, bony, papery hand round my hand and then jerked me sharply towards him. He smelt of paper and ink, of a finely balanced perfume of violet and aniseed, and beneath these scents a faint but unmistakable trace of something unclean, almost fecal. Someone is looking for you, he said. The uh, the prophet is such an interesting character, and I wanted to use this slide to kind of talk about him. So, I mean, this is obviously like we're starting to kind of get an understanding of what's happening here, right? Once this character shows up, the the mystery starts to unfold a little bit. I love I love his his view of what this place is is different from Ketterly's, but it obviously is still not the same as Piranesi's. Like, I love the fact that this is the man who found this place, whose entire career was built around proving the existence of this place, finding it and studying it. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's never stopped to think about why there are statues here that like Piranesi just saying, is that why there are statues? He's like, huh? I never, huh? Huh? I never thought about that. Uh Yeah. Good. Good point. Good point. Yeah. It's, it's great. It's great. Yeah, he's he's an interesting character. Also, like like he 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 thinks of himself as the smartest man who's ever lived, and he has this enormous arrogance. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is he is the person who discovered all of these worlds. Like he's not completely deluded. He 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 is this like extremely insightful, you know, mystic. It's just I I think I think that he. I, I don't know. I, I, there's a lot. There's a lot of interesting stuff to say about this character, and I'm not sure that I've unpacked all of it actually, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it's not that he's, you know, it, him and Ketterly are are two different people, right? Ketterly yeah. didn't discover the, the the other worlds. He just he just listened to the prophet and found his found his way there. Like mm-hmm. he he is just a, a a manipulator and a uh, you know a very unscrupulous and, and evil person. Whereas this guy. Um, he seems fairly amoral, but he's not yes. to the same level of monstrosity. I would, I would say. I mean, I don't know. I guess you could nitpick because he apparently knows that um, Ketterly is doing this to people, and not, and, and he's not doing anything about it. So who knows? Yeah, he di- um, he didn't come here to get Piranesi out of here. He came here mm-hmm. to just say, "Hey, someone's looking for you." Yeah, I mean, like his his whole role in this book is really interesting, right? Cause he's, yeah, like he's the originator. He's, he's the one that kind of starts to piece the puzzle together for us, but like, he's not active in anything um, at, at all here. He just ca- kind of, he's an old man at this point out of prison and he just kind of pops in to say, Hey, uh, by the way, there's someone looking for you. Thought you should know. Bye. Um, yeah. and th- presumably this is right after uh, the, the police officer, uh, Raphael, like came to, him right and yeah uh michael's reminding me that um that this character did kidnap and murder someone yeah um, yeah i mean we th- th- it's there's a bunch of corpses in this place right and we don't know we know some of them belong are because of ketterly but we don't know all of them i mean the, the folded up child is is one that i don't think we ever even get a hint at who that could possibly be right I think you're right. I mean, I I was actually before we found out some more of the backstory, I was imagining that like different people at different times would accidentally stumble into this realm because yeah, very possible. Yeah. The, the ritual of getting here seems to be so sort of vague that you could just sort of accidentally put yourself in that mental state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, you know, it, it kind of it's kind of a sad idea, but the imagine that just like like some some little little child just stumbled into this world and they didn't know how to get out and. Uh, starved basically yeah yeah and i love this idea that like um that ketterly has never had an original idea himself right that like Mm -hmm. he everything everything came from the prophet like and and he's even repeating what he was doing like we learned that rna sales uh would kidnap people and obviously take them here and try to study what happens to them poor james ritter which i like (laughs) another funny part of this book that whenever he writes about James Ritter, he writes him as poor James Ritter because that's what the prophet said the first time he said his name was poor James Ritter. So he writes poor James Ritter, um, which is just great. But um, so we Ketterly's just like copying 
his old teacher and trying to, you know, get the same thing he did. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, Dan brings up an important point here. Like, there, there's life here, right? Like, there's birds, there's, uh, there's fish, there's mussels. Like, mm-hmm. we're, like, that life must have come from somewhere. And if, like, mm-hmm. if the statues are representative of all the ideas and, and the, the things of our world, then that 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 animal stuff must have gotten in in some way right mm-hmm. yeah i guess so so and maybe I, so maybe the folded up child is truly just a tragic story of a, a child that through their childlike innocence wandered into this place and, and died i mean it's interesting because because now i i begin to wonder like to what degree is this a, a uh, okay so i was assuming this is a self-contained ecosystem at this point like you've got flocks of birds you've got albatrosses you've got fish you've got um you've got sunlight you know you've got wind and and, and rain um this is a self-contained sort of island like ecosystem um but that, where did it come from well it, it must have well, okay so i never thought about this and i just kind of figured it was magic um but maybe those animals did did get in there at some point and then they you know and, and then they bred once they were in mm-hmm. um um I mean, it's interesting because, like, the the um, the albatross is an interesting example, actually, because the albatross doesn't actually know really how to live in the house. Mm-hmm. Um, although you could argue that the house itself is like, I want this albatross to continue to thrive here, so I'm going to send it over to Piranesi, and Piranesi <laughs> will help it. Um, sure. Because it because he does, and they help each other, and and the albatross is probably are are less freaked out about him than they would be normally. Anyway, albatrosses are cool. Yeah, um, and albatrosses are also a very powerful literary symbol as well. Um, yes, which which works very well in this in this book. Uh, yeah, I, I I I like that. I I mean I I like that I like that it remains unsolved. We don't need to know the whole mysteries of the halls. We, it, it's unnecessary, but it's yeah. fun to think about these things. Yeah. Um, I, I want to circle back to something Michael said earlier when we got to the slide that like the idea that the the great and secret knowledge um is not like it, it's it's not like you're going to open a chest deep in the halls and find like a scroll that explains what the the great and secret knowledge is right this idea that the, the great and secret knowledge is actually to live your life in a in a way that Piranesi is doing now and presumably in a way that people used to um you know to to go with to go with the flow a little bit more to to chill out to relax to see the beauty in the place around you to not get not get lost in the the details of everything and the the wants the wanting for explanation the wanting for answers um to just to just you know let the house take care of you and I, we haven't we haven't talked about mental health yet but i do i do think there's something going on here with this idea of mental health and if you look at the house as kind of like you know navigating your own head right navigating Mm -hmm. the confusing scary um oftentimes mystifying nature that is human consciousness and what's going on in your own head and and you can try to you know to, you look at it as you're trying to set yourself straight and trying to, you know, mold yourself into this person and this thing and do this and behave this way and be this kind of normal thing. Or you can, you know, there's the, the Piranesi way of, of seeing it as this, this consciousness as, as your mind as this beautiful mystifying object that, uh, that is, is providing stuff for you, you know? Yeah, even even when you have to sort of scrounge to survive, you can still feel thankful for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. what what the world has given you, and, and yeah. that's always his attitude. Is, is, yeah. Uh, which yeah, that's, that's but it's uh, but it's oftentimes dangerous and scary. Like there, mm-hmm. like the the human mind is a, a is a scary place, and the think think the the you know there's a, there, we don't understand half of it, right? Like we don't we're just we're just starting to understand some things for the first time and it's it's really fascinating um yeah i also like maybe this is just pandemic talking but like the idea of here's a person who was extremely alone you know like like this idea of you're you're kind of alone and trapped inside your own head right totally alone for the most part he sees the other every other day but like but he doesn't he doesn't seem lonely ever, you know, mm-hmm. like he is, he is contented in, 
in his in his mind if we're calling it a, a, a metaphor for his mind and mm-hmm. yes he likes other people um he, he in some ways i think at the end he's like you, you gotta have like 70 people out there and i don't know yeah. if i can handle that many people um but but this idea that like i i, I think back like like this idea that you need to be you need to be cool and comfortable with yourself and with mm-hmm. just you you know and just like mm-hmm. that is something that a lot of people struggle with and a lot of people have struggled with a lot over the last couple of years you know yeah that's a very interesting connection i i i definitely you know he he whoever he was before he got here he became someone who was who doesn't really feel loneliness anymore mm-hmm. like you you imagine I, I can easily imagine that if um, if Ketterly never showed up, then he would just be in exactly the same state of contentment that he that, that we see him in, where yeah. he's just like, "Yep, yeah, I am the only person in the world, and that's the way it is." And there's nothing yeah. weird about that. And it's not that he doesn't like people; like he likes people a lot. Like when he learns about sixteen, he's very excited to that. There's another person here. I want to meet this person. I want to get to know them. I want to understand them. Uh, it's it's not it's not like an isolation, you know, born by. Uh, you know, a hatred of people or or an introverted nature. It's just you know sometimes, especially up at, up in here, it's just you, and you just gotta you just gotta deal with that. I think you know one of the things I'll never forget. I probably said this on a show before that my dad told me is like, you need you need to get you need to be okay with being alone sometimes because you're gonna be alone a lot in your life. There's gonna be moments in your life where you're just alone. And this is my father who was a pilot for many years, and so I think he spent he spent a lot of his life alone in a hotel room, you know, like mm-hmm. they, just cause they went on trips and yeah, the pilots hung out with each other and stuff. But at the end of the day, you're going to bed alone by yourself. And it's like, you need, you need to be okay being by yourself. Um, and yeah. I think, I think that's true. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I feel you there. I, I like to go on, you know, trips by myself and just, mm-hmm. just be present and not, not have any, any yeah. filtering of another person. And I like to go on trips with other people too. Both, both are good. Yeah. Um uh Mary, Mary I I I did not I know this. Connect, I I I didn't know this specifically. I knew that um Clark suffers from like very severe chronic fatigue syndrome, which is mm. what Mary Mary's mentioning. Um and, you know, doesn't spend much time hanging out with other people because she's, you know, kind of I don't know about literally bedridden, but she's she just doesn't doesn't have the energy to do stuff often and thus maybe she herself is the kind of person who is in her own labyrinth a lot of the time yeah um, no yeah that that makes oh i did not know that uh but that i think that that definitely adds something to this read i think that that there's de- we're definitely exploring this idea of lonely not loneliness is the wrong word but isolation yeah aloneness aloneness yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's right. and what that yeah I mean, I remember reading that that she she was suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome while writing Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and I was like, Jesus, if somebody can be suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome and write that book, then what's my excuse? I love, um, I, this is this is one of the things I love about you, man, because like, uh, you you like. <laughs> You take these like these these struggles that people go through, like this struggle, like you t- find successful people that have struggled to get to where they are, and your fr- your first reaction is, "Wow, that's impressive," and always your second reaction is, "Man, I fucking suck." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you gotta you gotta find ways to motivate yourself. I guess. I mean, sure, yeah, whatever it takes, right? But I just it's so consistent. Like as soon as you started down this you're path, like, I knew exactly what like, you were gonna say. You know, just autofill the rest of what Matt's saying yeah <laughs> all right point taken Scott <laughs> well wh- where were we sorry we, we got off on slide another. eight slide number eight all right so this is at the point where Piranesi damn it Piranesi realizes that um he has all these journals and records about all these things and names that he's been hearing uh and he just didn't realize it or didn't know it i love that this is there from the very beginning right because the first time he lists his journals he's like and this one says 2012 but then i came up with a better year numbering system and i i didn't think much about it after that Uh the end um, the, the entry here that I've recorded for a slide is one of the entries, uh, on, uh, Sylvia Diagostino, who is one of the uh, original kind of, um, what's the word disciples of, of the prophet. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, you know, I, we, t- we've already talked about how like you can use art 
in within art as a as a way to draw metaphor this particular part is talking about the two films that sylvia de agostino made uh, she's a filmmaker and so we'll read this and we'll talk about it two of her films survive Moon slash Wood, and The Castle. Moon Wood is a unique and atmospheric piece of filmmaking, admired by critics and fans outside the usual circle of RNA sales conspiracy theorists. It is 25 minutes long and was filmed on the moors in the woods around Manchester. It was shot on Super 8 in color, but the feel of it is almost entirely monochrome. Black woods, white snow, gray sky, etc., with occasional splashes of blood red. In the film, a hierophant of ancient times holds a small community in thrall. He dispenses cruelty to the men and abuses the women. One woman opposes him. To show his power and to punish her, the hierophant casts a spell. The woman crosses a stream. She takes a step, and her foot comes down in the moon's reflection. She is caught in the stream. She cannot move from the moon's reflection. The hierophant comes and beats her where she stands helpless. Still, she cannot move. Left alone, she asks a wood of birch trees to help her. As the hierophant passes through the wood, he becomes caught in the tangle of birch trees. They bind him and pierce him. He cannot move and eventually dies. The woman is released from the moon's reflection. Moon wood contains very little speech, and what there is 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 comp- incomprehensible. The woman and the hierophant speak their own language, which has nothing to do with ours. The true language of moon wood is simple, stark imagery. Moon, darkness, water, trees. Diagostino's other surviving film is even odder. It is untitled, but usually referred to as The Castle. It is shot on Betamax, and the quality is very poor. The camera meanders around various enormous rooms, presumably in different castles or palaces. We cannot be seeing one building. It is simply too vast. The walls are lined with statues and puddles of water crowd the floor. According to the people who believe in such things, this is a record of one of Arne Sale's other worlds, possibly the one described in his 2000 book, The Labyrinth. Other people have tried to establish locations in order to prove that this is not a film of another world, but to date, none of them have been conclusively identified. Notes in Diagostino's handwriting were found with the castle, but these are in the same peculiar code as her last diary and remain impenetrable. The, the plot thickens, I guess. Yeah. It, it, yeah. That's, this is some of the most fun stuff is like, we begin to realize what's going on and put things together. And yeah. the, the diaries are just, the diaries end up being such an important part of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you not only get so much information from them, but they're just, they're fun. They're just fun to read. Yeah. Uh, bipolar on is saying that these bits gave house of leaves vibes. Uh, I totally agree. That's the secret. Other reason why I pulled them. Mm. Um, uh, those of you who have read House of Leaves will understand that I'm not going to go into it, but yes, I, I totally agree. Um, I love, I love the moon wood thing, right? Like, because, you know, we looked at like the criticism or, or the, the way people looked at Diagostino and her relationship with, with sales. Right. Um, and, and obviously here we see it's very complicated and messy. Like this, the metaphor of what this, this movie is saying is is pretty obvious right like like he was a monster that was cruel to everyone around him including her right Mm -hmm. um he had her in his power he trapped her maybe he even trapped her here maybe like Mm -hmm. being trapped in the moon was being trapped in the halls Mm -hmm. and and uh and she wrote a story about it um and 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 i think most importantly what is the thing that saves her it is the wood of the she asks the wood of the birch tree she Mm -hmm. asks the world she asks you know like the Mm -hmm. the house the halls whatever you want to call it and and those these the things the things of the world not the people of the world come to her aid yeah yeah the the, like like we were saying earlier the the real magic is just being in tune and Mm -hmm. and listening and going with the flow and yeah and, and you know putting yourself at the mercy of the world yeah 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 i um i also i I didn't actually get the connection between arn sales and 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 the 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 movie that she made by the way so oh thank you for pointing that out well i mean i I, look i don't think i did not i did not get it until i like was rereading the passage for the slide and then i think i think i think once you once you head down that path the Mm -hmm. metaphor becomes obvious but i don't think that means it's obvious right away i mean certainly the book does not comment on it and say ah obviously she has a complicated (laughs) complicated relationship with her with her teacher or i don't i don't even know the word yeah everything is in a book for a reason though so Mm -hmm. i i I think i i agree with your your assessment here and diagostino also disappeared and and is presumably one of the bodies that uh he takes care of right yes yeah. yes that was my assumption yeah which is which is sad there's there's some background 
tragedy through yeah. all of this. Yeah, I mean, that's that, it's so interesting because another version of this book just tells the story of this group of mad scientists slash uh, scholars who discovered this world and kind of slowly destroyed each other over the course of three decades, right? Like, yeah. you could write a whole story from the perspective of this group and that that Clark chose to do it from this perspective is interesting where the, the the main focus of the book is never you know what happened to Arn Sales and D'Agostino and, and like the details of what happened in that relationship the details and what happened in the Ketterly relationship the de- like that's never the focus point of the book but I, I love how she she gives you enough of that for you to kind of draw the lines between them and and kind of see what happened with this group in the background mm-hmm. yeah 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 i i it, i wonder if there's anything to say about the idea that all these people who discovered this like magical inheritance were mostly not not mostly but a, a lot of them were you know became monsters i guess it's because they were seeking power but mm-hmm. some of them mm-hmm. weren't monsters though so it's not like it's not like the idea is everyone who was interested in finding these other worlds was a horrible person. Um, there's just a lot of kind of unhinged power seeking people. No, I think, I think that's, I like where you're going with that. This idea that like it took, it took these power hungry people to even bring a, a decent person like Piranesi to, to experience what this place is, you know, mm-hmm. like, it, mm-hmm. like, I mean, uh, there's not enough evidence for this, but presumably, like people don't stumble into this world all the time. You know, there's right. the, like they definitely do. Like I think, I th- well, uh, definitely is wrong. We don't know for sure whether all, all thirteen, thirteen um, of the the corpses here were brought in by some of the people we know or just stumbled in. We don't know that for sure, but we can assume that perhaps people stumble stumble in occasionally. But yeah, this idea that this is this is a, a place of beauty. Uh, and power um, that you know a, a person like Piranesi Matthew Rosorson would not would not have ever found on his own right right yeah he didn't in fact he wasn't even interested in finding it yeah he, he was yeah. laughing at it of course we talk about that in the slide coming yeah up. all right well let's let's move on then <laughs> to um uh Piranesi begins to encounter the 16th person and it throws him for a loop the other is right about one thing I am not as rational as I thought. I used to smile secretly at the other whenever I saw him acting out of self-love or arrogance or pride. My own actions were, I I was sure, guided solely by reason, but I was only deceiving myself. A rational person would never have spoken to the prophet in the north in, in the first northeastern hall. A rational person would have kept on cleaning the pavement of the sixth northwestern hall until every trace of 16's message was was erased. It is not the fact 16 is a woman that fascinates and excites me, or at least not entirely. It is the fact that she is another human being. I want to learn everything I can about her, or as much as I can learn without going mad. That is the tricky part. I have not told the other about the message that 16 wrote, nor have I told him that after I erased it, there were little half phrases and sentences remaining, and and that I left these untouched. Is Valentine Ketterly? This refers to the other. The prophet said that the other's name is Val Ketterly. It is not surprising that Sixteen writes about the other, since, according to the other, Sixteen is obsessed with him and wants to destroy him. Certainly groomed other potential victims, and I... Is Sixteen boasting of her victims, of the harm she has done and intends to do? Unclear. A disciple of the occultist Lawrence Armsay... Armsay... Armsales... Everything keeps leading back to this one same person, Lawrence Arn Sales, who I believe is identical with the prophet. Been here for almost six years. Did you, unclear what this refers to, Way Out is located, a puzzling fragment. 16 appears to want to tell me about an exit, but I know these halls, all their exits, uh, all their entrances, entrances and exits. She does not. I have looked up 16 in my index using the name the other called her. She is not there. So I shall look up Lawrence Arn Sales. This is just so. F- this is the most fun kind of dramatic irony where you're yeah. like, no, she's trying to help you, and like, like, like you can understand exactly what she's trying to say. Yeah, and, and he's just misinterpreting everything. It, it's um, so like this. I think this is one of those deceptively difficult, you know, choices as an author, right? Like mm-hmm. th- this idea of I want, I want to show enough of the message 
to where us, the reader, gets basically the entire message, right? But but in a way that hides the true intent from Piranesi, or, or, or maybe even not hides the true intent, but allows him a convenient misunderstanding or, or ignore, ignoring, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's the, the illusion of transparency thing is always hard in writing. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the fun part is the way, like, once again, we are, we are showing his general intelligence here because every little bit in parentheses here are the bits that he has filled in based off assumptions, right? Like mm-hmm. the message just said, writtenly groomed other potential victims he inserted the ce he made the logical leap to say oh this word's definitely certainly Mm -hmm. so he's making a lot of accurate assumptions off of everything here but he's not tying it all together you know and i think it goes like you know this is this is where the childishness comes through that, that like he has implicit trust in the other he believes everything Ketterly tells him because he has no reason not to no reason yeah. to no reason to assume this person would be lying to me or trying to manipulate like he recognizes right here you know i've looked at him and i saw him and i and i kind of laughed at him when he was acting out of self love or arrogance or pride i see these flaws in him but i'm not like i live in a world in which it wouldn't make sense to be deceitful with me why would you do that and mm-hmm. and so why would i assume he, so he just takes everything he he has to say for granted yeah yeah i i like you know the uh, i'm going to tie together some, something dan says here with something that's that's on this page actually where where he's saying you know i was sure that my actions were guided by reason um and and you know but but a rational person wouldn't have done this and, and dan points out like he thinks of himself as a scientist he he, he repeatedly thinks like you know me, me me and and the other are both scientists mm-hmm. and it's funny because he is only he, his incisive mind only works when it is in a, in alignment and focused on the house. Mm-hmm. It completely falls apart when he tries to focus on anything else, and it takes like a, a really hugely disproportionate amount of of evidence to um you know remind to to get basically to get him back on track of you know realizing what's going on. Yeah. Um because he's not he's not rational. Like he you know, like he's he's distinctly not rational because that's yeah. how he's able to commune with the house actually. Um I mean he he thinks that the birds flying around is telling him messages, right? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I like what what Doom is saying here too, like is he even a scientist? What does he do and what does Matthew Rosaurus and do? I know he's working on a book about Ketterly, but is he is he a scholar? I, I, I. Yeah, I mean, I think he's a. I think he's he's something like a journalist or, or a historian yeah, or a yeah. or a or a, he's a researcher of some kind. Yeah. Um, which is not the same thing as a scientist. Yeah. Um. So I, I like the idea that he considers himself a scientist because of Ketterly specifically. That, mm-hmm. that like Ketterly is 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 trying to solve a problem, perhaps using science, and so Ketterly keeps approaching it from a scientific way and so eventually piranesi just like assumes that identity of i am also a scientist and and he certainly like that's the that's the fascinating thing he's certainly a very detail rich guy like before he even got the 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 entire reason we're reading this book to begin with is because matthew rose and piranesi take incredibly detailed notes about everything mm-hmm. that's just like one of the things that they they did and and could, like and not like not only take detailed notes but like index their notes which is just like i read that and i was like that's insane like i would <laughs> how do you have enough time to index your journals like let alone to write journals but then to index all your journals yeah. like um so he's he's incredibly detail oriented but scientist no rational definitely not mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's every everybody thinks they're mm-hmm. rational but yeah what wasn't Ketterly funny? Dan says, "Yeah, Ketterly's funny. I mean, it's part of the dramatic irony going on, but yeah, he's yeah. he's also yeah. I mean, it's funny. Like he feels like he's from a different story because he's he's clearly from our world, and and you know the character who is now Piranesi behaves like a you know a mad prophet from the desert, basically. Like he's just he's he talks in a completely different way and, and mm-hmm. thinks mm-hmm. in a completely different way. So. Yeah." Speaking of not behaving rationally, I think this next slide kind of perfectly, perfectly comes into exactly what we were talking about. 
The description of Lawrence Arne Sale's theories contained in my journals correspond closely with, to what the prophet said himself, more evidence that they are one and the same person. I was pleased to re rediscover the name Adi Damaris and to have it its correct spelling. This was the name the other called on in his ritual three months ago. I feel certain that the other learnt of Adi Damaris from Lawrence Arne Sale's. All his ideas are mine, the prophet said. One sentence puzzles me. The world was constantly speaking to ancient man. I do not understand why this sentence is in past tense. The world still speaks to me every day. I believe I am better at reading these journal entries than I was at first. I remain calm, even when faced with the most obscure language. Words and phrases that pulsate with mysterious energy, words such as Manchester and police station, no longer decompose. Dis discompose me. I seem, almost unconsciously, to have fallen into the habit of treating these entries as if they were the writings of an oracle or seer, someone in a frenzied or inspired state who imparts knowledge, albeit in strange and not easy, easily processed form. Perhaps I was indeed in an altered state of consciousness when I wrote them. I find this theory persuasive, but it leaves several questions unanswered. What did I do to achieve this altered state? And why, when I have always thought of myself as a scientist, did I begin this practice in the first place? Um, I think this is maybe the part where we can mention one of the most important things is that Piranesi very clearly ripped pages out of his own journals and tore them up to avoid dealing with the truth of them mm -hmm, and then right. forgot about it later. Yeah. Um, right. Some real memento shit going on here, right? Yeah, the, the, it's it's interesting because I, I don't think that the text ever specifically says that this happened, but it, you can infer a period of time between him first being trapped in the labyrinth and becoming the character that we see here mm -hmm. where he was um where where it was much more kind of awful and he was losing his mind yeah and you can almost infer that like the choice was a choice between just totally losing his mind and becoming the, the way the other characters described of not being able to even string a sentence together or just yeah. sort of giving himself over to the house which required you know, burying his past. Yeah, yeah. Forgetting about it completely. And and I love this because you can kind of see how that past version of him must have done it, right? You know, like like right right in here, he said, "I've just decided that words such as Manchester and police station no longer discompose me." You know, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. It's just like it's just a it's just an oracle. And sometimes when oracles are are giving their prophecies, not everything they say makes sense, and that's fine. Uh, I'm a scientist, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I the other fun part about this is how he's actually doing um, – he's bending over backwards to um, justify the fact that he's just fascinated by the existence of, of 16 and really wants to talk to her. And he, like, like he's already basically made up his mind that he's not going to, you know, betray 16 to mm -hmm. – to, um, Ketterly, yeah. but he won't like admit that to himself. So he's just doing all of these little little tricks, like, yeah. not erasing the message completely. Uh, um, yeah, that's right. I do love like when when the flood is about to come and he talks to to the, uh, Ketterly, and he's like, "Whatever you do, don't tell sixteen about the flood." And then let's let's like he he doesn't even like. There's not even a point where he says makes the decision to not listen to him and just to do it. He just goes and does it. Like he mm -hmm. gets out of his meeting with Ketterly and then immediately goes to figure out a way to warn 16 mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, this is what's great about this is like, I think we can assume that perhaps in some ways this has happened before. Like we are told by Ketterly that Piranesi has come to him in the past with doubts about what they're doing and uncertainty about, about, you know, searching for the knowledge and, and the point of it all. And we know that Piranesi, you know, is, is this really complicated character because on the one hand, he is very upfront and honest and straightforward. On the other hand, we see him hold stuff back from the other constantly because mm -hmm. he's worried about his reaction. And so we can kind of assume that maybe, you know, when he came to him with his worry about, uh, what they're doing maybe he had a whole lot more going on underneath that that he just didn't admit to the other mm -hmm. and so we don't get to see about it because he yanked those pages out of his book and tore them up um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, i i think that's a that's an interesting point so i mean he, there's there's a possibility that he's discovered who matthew rose Swordson is many well, times over yeah. the, over these six years that he's been here yeah, and he and he keeps he keeps struggling, and and the, the house the house erases his memory again because yeah, it's the only thing that gets him back to a state of of uh, you know contentment. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's interesting. All right, um, shall we move on? Mm-hmm. 
So here we have, uh, we finally learned that Piranesi is a man named Matthew Rose Sorensen, and we see his story. And here he's asking Ketterly about the world. Why a labyrinth, do you suppose? I asked. What do you mean? Why do you think he described the other world, the one he said he went to most often, as a labyrinth? Ketterly shrugged. A vision of cosmic grandeur, I suppose. A symbol of the mingled glory and horror of existence. No one gets out alive. Okay, I said. But what I still don't quite understand was how he convinced you of its existence. The labyrinth world, I mean. He had us perform a ritual that was supposed to bring us there. There were aspects of the ritual that were evocative, I suppose. Suggestive. A ritual, really? I thought Arnsale's position was that rituals were nonsense. Didn't he say something like that in the half-seen door? That's right. He claimed that he personally was able to access the labyrinth world simply by making an adjustment to his frame of mind, by returning to a childlike state of wonder, a pre-rational consciousness. He claimed to be able to do this at will. Unsurprisingly, most of us, his students, got absolutely nowhere with this, so he created a ritual that we were to perform in order to access the labyrinth. But he made it clear that this was a concession to our lack of ability. <laughs> I see. Most of you? What? You said most of you couldn't enter the labyrinth without the ritual. It seemed to imply that some of you could. A slight pause. Sylvia. Sylvia thought she could get there in the same way that Lawrence did, with this return to a state of wonder. She was a strange girl, as I've said. A poet. She lived very much inside her head. <laughs> Who knows what she thought she saw. And did you ever see it? The labyrinth? He considered. Mostly I had what you might call intimations, a sense of standing in a huge space. Not just wide, but immensely tall, too. And this is quite hard to admit, but yes, I did see it once. I mean, I thought I saw it once. So this is just a, a snapshot of the scene, but I love this whole scene between Sorensen and Ketterly, where you kind of know at this point that Ketterly is lying. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I think the most, the, my favorite bit, maybe in this whole scene, is yeah i saw i saw a labyrinth one um hey does anyone know you're here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and Sorensen's it, it, like uh, what uh, what um th th uh -huh. i think my my initial reaction the first time i read that was matthew you dumb idiot get the fuck out like if someone asks uh -huh. you that get the fuck out of there but i think this is a a a core piranesiism uh -huh. that he does not immediately recognize the danger in that yeah. question. He's just like, that was a weird non sequitur. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Um, your your old boss that kidnapped a bunch of people and went to prison for it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, What's the deal? Yeah, let's do this ritual. Oh, you're going to... Huh, that, that's odd. It looks as though you've been doing this ritual almost every night. Yeah. <laughs> from... But but whatever. Well, I'll just chuckle along. Oh 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 no. Oh no. Yeah, it's it's so f he's such a fascinating character. I, I I love. We do see some some Piranesiisms here as well. Like this this part right here, like um, where he says, "You said most of you couldn't enter the labyrinth without the ritual." It seemed to imply that some of you could. We see him do the same thing to Ketterly earlier in the book, right? Mm -hmm. Where where Ketterly says something, uh, like he's mentioning that he's looking for someone who could who who could commune with the dead and then Piranesi's like oh oh uh the, like which of the wh what's which is the dead person's name you know like uh -huh. he he takes he, he's very sharp in like seeing someone's slip up some yeah. in, in in what they're saying and detecting meaning beyond that he's very sharp in that in both in this conversation and all the conversations we see with Piranesi and the other but then he does things like just not just his complete lack of concern or his his complete willingness to kind of be be guided and manipulated into this whole thing yeah i mean he's a combination of incredibly perceptive and and trusting mm -hmm. um so, so like he'll notice something's off but like like you said earlier be like well there's no surely there's no reason why this person would wish me harm so <laughs> So I, I, I guess there must be some explanation for that weird thing that he just said, but yeah. I'll, I'll, whatever, you know. Yeah, he's a he's a weird guy. Um, yeah, just general advice out there, uh, uh -huh. children. Um, if someone, if you're if you're having a conversation with someone and it's just the two of you, and they say the phrase, "Does anyone know you're here?" Mm -hmm. 
Go get get yeah. out get out out of there. Go away. And never leave. never let them take you to the second location. Yeah, <laughs> never let them take you to the second location. Yeah, if someone says let's perform the ritual just for funsies, <laughs> uh, don't do that. I, I, I've I've never had that go well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, personally. that's a good way of putting it. Uh, Doom. He's he's simultaneously very sharp in catching inconsistencies, but also very willing to explain away those inconsistencies. Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, I, I can't help but think that some of his perceptiveness is maybe something that, you know, the house likes about him to put to mm-hmm. to, perfun- to personify the house. Like that, he he is he is able to just be present and absorb all of these details yeah. non judgmentally. This is uh, this is interesting. I, I think, you know, I'm trying to think if if the book is saying that a personality like Piranesi slash Matthew Rose Sorensen is like. A desirable one because the same thing that allows him to see the beauty in the house is the traits that get him trapped in it in the first place mm-hmm. right yeah well i mean like so so i actually compare this to like you know the, the ideal meditative state in in you know buddhism for example is, is a sort of non-judgmental awareness mm-hmm. um, which is actually great for cultivating the exact kind of um contentment that this character has but it's not a great state of mind for doing anything Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, or getting getting things done, solving problems, um, existing in, in the social fabric of reality. Yeah. Um, so maybe he does have exactly the right psyche for just slotting into this magical world, but it, it's it's not something that serves him well when it comes to other people. Yeah. I, I think, I, and to, to go back to our kind of our mental health motif here, like the idea that like it is a person that can very easily get trapped in their own brain is also the person that can learn to love it in there, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's move on to, uh, this. So, so we have gotten, um, the police detective 16 has gotten in touch with, um, with Matthew Rose Sorensen, AKA Piranesi at this point. Um, and now we get to talk about the beloved child of the house a little bit here. There's something I have to tell you, she said. I don't know if you remember this, but you have a mum and a dad and two sisters and friends. She gazed at me intently. Do you remember? I shook my head. They've been looking for you, she said, but they don't know the right place to look. They've been worried about you. They've been... She looked away again to find the right words to express her thought. They've felt pain because they don't know where you were, she said. I considered this. I'm sorry that Matthew Rose Sorensen's mum and dad and sisters and friends feel pain, I said, but I don't really see what that has to do with me. You don't think of yourself as Matthew Rose Sorensen? No, I said. But you have his face, she said. Yes. And his hands? Yes. And his feet and his body. All that is true, but I haven't got his mind and I haven't got his memories. I don't mean that he's not here. He is here, I touched my breast, but I think he's asleep. He's fine. You mustn't worry about him. She nodded. She was not a contentious person as the other had been. She did not argue and contradict everything I said. I liked that about her. Who are you? She asked. If you're not him. I am the beloved child of the house, I said. The house? What is the house? Such a strange question. I spread my arms to indicate the first vestibule, the halls beyond, the first vestibule, everything. This is the house. Look. Oh, I see. So, again, this is kind of the the innate conflict of of this book between the mm-hmm. like because at the same time, like you want Piranesi to go home and be with his family again, right? Like, yeah. like you feel bad, like that's this this contradiction that like no, you should want to go home and be with your mother and father and your siblings and and the people that love you. You should rejoin them. They miss you. They want to see you again. On the other, you completely understand that he's this not that person anymore, really, and and mm-hmm. that that he is contented in the life that he lives. Yeah, I I found this to be quite a quandary actually, because I was like, is is the right thing to do to leave him here because he's clearly actually content, even though he is you know, in one framing the victim of of magical amnesia, he's in one of th- these these mind traps. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or is the right thing to do to, to you know, to, to be like, hey, uh, you know, you're, you're not you're not in your right mind. You can't be trusted to make that decision. We're going to 
take you back to the real world. You're going to remember who you are. Um, I guess I would lean to the idea that like the, the, the ethical choice is probably to take him back to the real world, let him regain his senses and then give him the op the option to go back to the, yeah. um, to, to the, um, to the labyrinth, mm -hmm. uh, which he could, which he could do. There's no implication that he can't go back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right. I, it's 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 complicated because we get into this idea of like like he has convinced himself that Piranesi and Matthew Rose Sorensen are independent, individual, different people, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's necessarily a hundred percent true. I think that's one of the things like he, he, uh, that, that started as kind of like a coping mechanism for him that like, he didn't want to deal with the truth. And so he kind of filed this person away. It's like, oh, I'm not this person anymore. I think we've already kind of seen in the ways, in the things we've seen about Matthew Rhodes Swords and that they're, they're kind of, they're kind of similar people. They're, they're, yeah. they're, he's obviously, the, this experience has changed him in certain ways, obviously, but, but there, there are a lot of similarities to them as well. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Again, the text doesn't really tell us metaphysically which one is true, but I, I feel like it would be, you know, if you if you hit your head and and lost and, and you know had amnesia and woke up in the woods and then you just like made a life for yourself there in the woods, are you still you? And, and yeah. this, is, this is one of those conversations that we used to have all the time in in Ward because that's a story that really really plays with these sorts of concepts. I think this is one of those conversations that we have on book club every month yeah. too. Somehow <laughs> it always gets yeah. back to this questions of identity which we ha which we have all the time yeah but yeah but it's like it's like under some definitions of you yeah you are the same person under some other definitions of you maybe you're not mm -hmm. so um i i feel i feel comfortable you know basically agreeing with what you just said that like there's clearly a lot of continuity and personality and um it makes sense to give matthew restaurant said a chance to um come back to life and make it make his own decision uh-huh yeah, I mean, like, like tr if we if we take him for his word, then there's a there's a whole person sleeping inside Piranesi that deserves the right to make his own choices about things, right? He's just like, right. yeah, don't don't worry about him, he's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, pe people are talking about Raphael, the detective. That is that is her last name. I forget what her first name is, but yeah, and that's another Italian artist. You know, um, mm -hmm. we have Piranesi in Italian. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's probably right. intentional. Is Raphael, I think painter, I don't know, sculptor. I mean, like this is the Renaissance. I... They all did everything. Yeah. I feel like all the, did Raphael make sculptures? I mean, he, was, known an, for he his... was an architect. His pal yeah. An architect painting. I don't see anything about sculptors. Maybe he was just a painter. Mm -hmm. anyway. He was a Ninja Turtle. Most importantly. Most importantly, he was a Ninja Turtle, and that is his true legacy. He's cool but rude. Yeah. He is. He is. I mean, he's kind of everyone's favorite, if you think about it. He is. A thousand years from now, he'll be remembered as the one with the red headband. <laughs> I think they oh. changed. No, they didn't change the colors, but have you looked at modern day Ninja Turtles? It's incomprehensible. I, I try not to. <laughs> um, all right. Shall we move on to 13? Yeah. Kedeli drowns in the great flood and Piranesi takes care of his body. I found Dr. Kedeli's body in the angle of the staircase in the eighth vestibule. He had been battered against the walls and the statues. His clothes were in rags. I disentangled him from the balustrade and laid him out straight and composed his limbs. I took his poor broken head into my lap and cradled it. Your good looks are gone, I told him, but you mustn't worry about it. This unsightly condition is only temporary. Don't be sad. Don't fear. I will place you somewhere where the fish and the birds can strip away all this broken flesh. It will soon be gone. Then you will be a handsome skull and handsome bones. I will put you in good order, and you can rest in the sunlight and starlight. The statues will look down on you with blessing. I am sorry that I was angry with you. Forgive me. I did not find the gun. The tides must have taken it deep within themselves. But later that morning, I found Dr. Kettley's boat still idling on the waters in the first western hall, which were now no more than ankle deep. It was quite unharmed. I wish that you had saved him, I told it. I did not feel that it responded in any way. It seemed drowsy, dozing, only half alive. Without the rushing waters to animate it, it was no longer the devil that had danced on the waves, first mocking Dr. Kettley and then abandoning him. 
I've been thinking about what Raphael said about Matthew Rose Sorensen's mom and his dad and his sisters and his friends. Perhaps I should send them a message explaining that Matthew Rose Sorensen now lives inside me, that he is unconscious but perfectly safe, and that I am a strong and resourceful person who will care for him assiduously, exactly as I care for any others of the dead. So I wanted to use this, you know, to talk about about Piranesi's care of the dead, because this mm. is something very specific that the book mentions over and over again, that there are, there are, you know, 13 corpses in this place. And we, we've kind of referenced around it, but we haven't really talked about it directly. Mm-hmm. And he takes care of these. He brings them food and water and talks to them and takes care of them. Um, and these are just bones. Like he's, he's very meticulous in the way he cares for these bones. Like when the flood is coming, he moves them. He takes days. He takes days to move them up to a safer level. You know, mm-hmm. um, what, what did you think about this? I mean, what is, what is the book kind of trying to say with his meticulous care of the dead here. I'm not sure. This is one element that I am the least sure of um, because it doesn't quite easily slot in anywhere, mm-hmm. you know, like, like it, is this something that the house demands of him in some sense? Is this just some aspect of Matthew Rose Sorensen wants to care for these other victims and it has empathy for them um you know as he speaks to ketterly's body here it almost seems as though he thinks that he's talking to ketterly and that ketterly is you know still resides in the body Mm -hmm. um and that death is maybe just like another state of being a person um yeah and and and, you know is this something and for, for a guy who basically spends all of his time with statues perhaps you know an inanimate you know, form has its own, you know, life in, in his mind, you know, mm-hmm. or, 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 or the idea, you know, the, the idea that, um, if you, if you, if you see meaning in, you know, if the world speaks to you, if the statues speak to you, if the birds speak to you, then in some sense, a bag of, of bones could speak to you. Yeah. Um, just in a different way. Yeah. I like that. He sees no material difference between a bag of bones and the person that was that bag of bones prior mm. to their death. Um, there, there's no difference in his mind like that, that if, if, if the folded up child was here, a living human being, he would take care of the folded up child in the exact same way. He would take care of the remains of the folded up child. There is no difference. You know, a person, a, a, a everything here, everything here is alive. Everything here is important and meaningful and, and should be taken care of. And, mm-hmm. Um, it's just another reflection of his love of the house in general, that, that, that these are, these are the people in the house and it, it, it doesn't matter. Like, why are you, why are you making a distinction between living and dead? Right? Like why? Um, he doesn't, Mm -hmm. he doesn't doesn't do that. He, there's no line he draws. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful though. It's, it's Mm -hmm. a very, it's, it's, it's a very moving poignant part of the story, which, In some sense, it's not necessary. Like, it's not plot relevant that he does this, really. Mm-hmm. But it's um, it's just, yeah, it's really strong. It's not plot relevant. I do think it's it's characterization relevant. I think one of the clever things about it is Clark can put this at the very beginning of the book. And it as, as much as we are confused about where we are and what's going on and what is this and what even is this book, it allows us to have a very clear understanding of, hey, this book. Piranesi guy is a good person you know like he's he's showing kindness towards a thing that that no one would blame him for just ignoring you know like Mm -hmm. like his willingness to extend empathy to as doom is pointing out here he takes care of the albatross and the albatross's family again as well he takes care of everything this is this is this is the place that he lives it is the house the house is generous and so he must be generous to it like i think that was that was in i think uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna hop back in slides here real quick because i want to i want to get the exact point like is it disrespectful to the house to love some statues more than others? I sometimes ask myself this question. It is my belief that the house itself loves and blesses equally everything that it has created. Should I try to do the same? So that's what he's doing. Like, what what is the difference between an albatross and a statue or uh, mm-hmm. an albatross and uh, a, a pile of bones or mm-hmm. the other or, or anything else? You know, it's mm-hmm. that's it's the, it's the same. It's existence. It's life. It's the world. It's yeah. all of it. We should take care of it all. All of right. it. Right. 
I, and I mean, I think that's like the beautiful gl glowing feeling that this book left me with because obviously this is all a metaphor for the world. Like the world is the house. Mm -hmm. Our world is the house. The world is a, a realm of beauty and majesty mm -hmm. and meaning. And um, does the world actually care for us and love us? Well, I think that if you feel like it is, then it kind of is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah yeah um you know it, it, it like like we said is the house literally caring for piranesi or is he is he merely existing in a sort of dreamlike state where he's 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 intelligently taking care of himself but attributing it to the house yes no it doesn't matter it's it's um it, it's really about the it's about the approach it's yeah. about the the way of seeing more than about what the fact of the matter actually is. Yeah. And you know, there will be floods and, and people will die and things will get broken and damaged and cracked and, you know, ceilings will collapse and mm -hmm. things will decay. And like, th that is true whether you're in magical halls or in the real world. But like, um, the, 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 it's, it's beautiful. Like, no, we're, we're, I, my room is not filled with beautifully crafted statues that represent ideals, but it's, my room is filled with art. There's art everywhere. I have art all over my walls. I have mm -hmm. a big stack of movies that is right over here that is beautiful art. I have a bookshelf behind me filled with beautiful art, and it's it's all wonderful. And it, it like it, I I I love I love this. You know, it's it's just at times a simple, a simplistic, but a very beautiful and reassuring view of existence. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What's wrong with that? Yeah, D Dan points out here that like, and and I and I I kind of disagree here, and only it's only because Dan says that like, the thing is that he's like this whole personality that's been implemented into him by the house. He's become an avatar of the house. I don't I don't like that, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying I don't like that because I think that takes too much of the agency away from Piranesi himself that if he's like that it's not him anymore that it, like this is like this is this is actually kind of why I was a little resistant Matt to your idea of of the house taking care of him because I like this as just I I, I like the metaphor as just like a no, it's just like this is existence, and mm -hmm. it, we we can make it feel like it's providing for us. If we're sitting here eating an apple, like the world provided me this yeah. apple. Yeah, I I paid for it. Yeah, I I bought it or I grew it, but like the world provided this for me, and and it's all about outlook. So I I, I it feels not wrong, but I'm hesitant to put too much mm -hmm. influence on the on the world in that sense. Yeah, to, to me, it relates to the idea that you can actually have gratitude without a target. Mm -hmm. you're, you're just, you're just grateful, not to anyone or anything. And, and that's, that's actually an incredibly like, uh, life affirming and, and, uh, uh I don't know, meaningful way of existing is just r reminding yourself to be grateful. Yeah. Um, yeah. for just, just being alive. Um, yeah, this is the smallest thing, you know, and it's like, you don't you don't have to have a target of that, um, and 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 he, I guess he's grateful to the house, but that's another that's another way of saying he's just grateful to that which is the universe. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, we got two more slides, so let's get through them, and and then I think we'll be able to continue this conversation. All right. Piranesi lived among the statues, silent presences that bought him comfort and enlightenment. I thought that in this new old world, the statues would be irrelevant. I did not imagine that they would continue to help me. But I was wrong. When faced with a person or situation I do not understand, my first impulse is still to look for a statue that will enlighten me. I think of Dr. Dr. Ketterly, and an image rises up in my mind. It is the memory of a statue that stands in the 19th Northwestern Hall. It is the statue of a man kneeling on his plinth. A sword lies at his side, its blade broken in five pieces. Round about lie other broken pieces, the remains of a sphere. The man has used his sword to shatter the sphere because he wanted to understand it. But now that he has found that he has destroyed both sphere and sword, this puzzles him. But at the same time, part of him refuses to accept that the sphere is broken and worthless. He has picked up some of the fragments and stares at them intently in the hopes that they will eventually bring him new knowledge. I think of Lawrence Arn Sales, and an image rises up in my mind. It is the memory of a statue that stands in an upper vestibule facing the head of a staircase, the one rising up and out of the 32nd vestibule. 
The statue represents a heretic, her, heretical pope seated on the throne. I don't know why I had so much trouble with that word. He is fat and bloated. He lolls on his throne, a shapeless mass. The throne is magnificent, but the sheer bulk of the figure threatens to split it in two. He knows that he is repulsive, but you can see by his face that the idea pleases him. He revels in the thought that he is somehow shocking. In his face there is mingled laughter and triumph. Look at me, he seems to say. Look at me. I think of Raphael, and an image, no, two images, rise up in my mind. In Piranesi's mind, Raphael is represented by a statue in the 44th Western Hall. It shows a queen in a chariot, the protector of her people. She is all goodness, all gentleness, all wisdom, all motherhood. That is Piranesi's view of Raphael, because Raphael saved him. But I choose a different statue. In my mind, Raphael is better represented by a statue in an antechamber that lies between the 45th and the 62nd Northern Halls. This statue shows a figure walking forward, holding a lantern. It is hard to determine with any certainty the gender of the figure. It is androgynous in appearance. From the way she, or he, holds up the lantern, all appears at whatever is ahead, one gets the sense of huge darkness surrounding her. Above all, I get the sense that she is alone, perhaps by choice, or perhaps because no one else was courageous enough to follow her into the darkness. I don't have a lot of, you know, smart things to say about this other than I found this incredibly beautiful writing just like mm-hmm. from from beginning to end this is it's just a lot of reading i'm sorry it took so long to do that but this whole thing is just like like just a clinic and just really beautiful powerful impactful writing yeah i mean this is why this is the kind of stuff that makes me love her as a writer it's yeah. the kind of stuff yeah. that i love so much about um jonathan strange and mr norrell where mm-hmm. it's 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 not it's not plot. It's not even, it, it, I guess it's characterization, but mm-hmm. mainly it's just there. It's just, it is beautiful on its, on, on its own terms. It yeah. almost requires no justification. It just is a, a beautiful page of writing. Um, and I, it's, it's uh, like that. That's why I never minded Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell being so incredibly long because it's just like, why would I mind page after page of just like beautiful? Yeah. This type of stuff, you know? Yep. Yep. I hope it does not take 17 years for her to write her next book. Although I understand if she has a a chronic condition, why, why it took so long. Certainly. Um, Yeah. I, I, yeah, I hope, I hope she's able to, but I, I I feel like, I feel like these are, these are gifts. And, you know, to go back to our art metaphor here, like I am a person that loves art. I love stories. I love movies. I love books. I watch them and read them all the time. And I do kind of constantly, uh, learn to understand the people that I coexist on this world with through my understanding of the art that I read. Like, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm certain other people do this. I don't know if you do, but like I, I do like to, to Piranesi, he uses the statues as a lens with which to understand people. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I use stories the lens to understand people all the time things i learn mm-hmm. in stories things about people i learn in stories if i see an action or a, a personality trait that reminds me of a character i've read about or uh, or or watched i i use that I, that is that is part of my arsenal to understand and and learn about people and i think that's what's going on here in, in a way yeah you learn about people you learn about yourself even you know mm-hmm. that's why i always say i love the i love the characters who are who are just kind of moderately bad people Mm -hmm. because they they get you to look at the parts of yourself that you don't like but that you avoid looking at yeah and um that's really the only way that you can improve is if you have something kind of forcing you to look at that Mm -hmm. Uh, i I love it yeah i'm gonna thank you tringard for backing me up on this i was like i bet bet a lot of people do this and then i slowly learned that nope i'm the only one Um, no i i I totally i totally i mean i you you, where else are we going to learn psychology other than reading you know yeah writers sort of attempts to get into the psychology of yeah 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 i like what doom says that this is almost and this is almost an archetypal representation of the character right and i love them they're so creative like this idea that like you just the thing that the thing that i love about this is it, it almost takes a lot of you know authorial confidence to say i'm going to have you read about this guy for 200 pages 
And then at the very end of the book, I'm going to summarize him in an image. And if the image feels off to you, that whole thing falls apart. Right. But mm-hmm. he says like, here's Dr. Ketterly. Boom. Here's mm-hmm. a perfect metaphor. And you read that and you're like, yes, <laughs> fucking yes, exactly. Exactly. You, yeah. you got, I mean, of course she got him, she made him, but like, just like that it's, it's clear and communicated clearly and wonderfully and simply that, yeah, he's a guy that will, will destroy the very thing he's trying to understand and, mm-hmm. and, is incapable of even understanding that he's destroyed it. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just the, the, the giant heretical Pope and, yeah. <laughs> and, and reveling in his, in his shocking nature. Yeah. yeah reveling in his repulsion. Yeah. yeah. God, yeah. that's, we, we barely see Lawrence Arn sales, but like, you're just like, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. All right. Shall we move on to the last slide? Mm-hmm. All right. The ending of the book. This afternoon, I walked through the city, making for a cafe where I was to meet Raphael. It was about half past two on a day that had never really gotten, I had never really got light. It began to snow. The low clouds made a gray ceiling for the city. The snow muffled the noise of the cars until it became almost rhythmical, a steady shushing noise like the sound of tides beating endlessly on marble walls. I closed my eyes. I felt calm. There was a park. I entered it and followed through an avenue of tall ancient trees with wide dusky grasses, grassy spaces on either side of them. The pale snow sifted down through bare winter branches. The light of the cars on the distant road sparkled through the trees, red, yellow, white. It was very quiet. Though it was not yet twilight, the streetlights shed a faint light. People were walking up and down the path. An old man passed me. He looked sad and tired. He had broken veins on his cheeks and a bristly white beard. As he screwed up his eyes against the falling snow, I realized I knew him. He was depicted on the northern wall of the 48th Western Hall. He is shown as a king with a little model of a walled city in one hand, while the other hand, while while the other hand he raises in blessing. I wanted to seize hold of him and say to him, "In another world, you are a king, noble and good. I have seen it." But I hesitated a moment too long, and he disappeared into the crowd. A woman passed me with two children. One of the children had a wooden recorder in his hands. I knew them, too. They are depicted in the 27th Southern Hall, a statue of two children laughing, one of them holding a flute. I came out of the park. The city streets rose up around me. There was a hotel with a courtyard of metal tables and chairs for people to sit in or clement weather. Today they were snow-strewn and forlorn, a lattice of wire strung across the courtyard, Paper lanterns were hanging from the wires, spheres of vivid orange that blew and trembled in the snow and the thin wind. The sea-gray clouds raced across the sky and the orange lanterns shivered against them. The beauty of the house is immeasurable. It's kindness infinite. (sighs) It's just the perfect way to end this book. Yeah. Uh, I love I love the old man. I love that he looks sad and tired with broken veins on his cheeks. He's an old downtrodden man. No, when I look at you I see a king. I see a king. Uh-huh. A good king, noble and good. Yeah. And you know, I think okay, my interpretation of this last page is that he can now see the beauty of everything. Yep. Doesn't yep. need to be. Mhm. In Does the it, house. No. I mean, that's what, like, what he's, well, the final words here, he's looking at the lattice of wire strung across the courtyard, paper lanterns. The beauty of the house is immeasurable. It's yeah. kindness infinite. It doesn't, it doesn't stop in that one place. It is everywhere. It is everything. Mm-hmm. Just because you're not in the halls, you're not in the, that literal house anymore. Yeah. It's all of it. And, and I think that's, that's what, that's the other thing that makes you kind of happy is he is, you don't really know if this is Piranesi or if this is Matthew Rose Sorensen. And I think the idea that I walk away with is, is like, y- yes, this is, yeah, this yeah is, yes, this is, yeah. this is a version of Piranesi that is able to function in the real world. And he has the memories of the man who he was and he, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, and he just is the, he is a continuation of, of both of those personalities. Yeah. And I love, you know, we talked about this at the beginning about the, the common noun capitalization it's gone here mm-hmm. uh, until that last line. Mm-hmm. The beauty of the house is immeasurable, all capitalized. It's kindness. Kindness capitalized. Infinite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. Love this book. 
Love this book so much. What a what a what a delightful little story. Not too doesn't take too long to read. Um, just a pleasure from page one till the very end. I agree. Um, just uh, one of my favorites of of the book club. I think. Oh yeah, with without a doubt. And yeah. she's one of my favorite authors right now. Like I, 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 I wish I had. I wish I had 60 <laughs> Susanna Collins books to, to devour over the next four years, yeah. but uh, I, we're blessed with the ones we have, truly. Uh, D- Doom says this reminds me, this, this reminds her of, of the island of Dr. Moreau, um, <laughs> which is basically the opposite tonally. Mm-hmm. Uh, the protagonist has escaped the horror, but finds that he has brought the horror with him. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's, 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 he's escaped the, the beating contentment, but brought the beating contentment with him. I love it. Well, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by sloppy, Dan. I mean, the 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 line at the end of the movie, or it's the book. We've been talking about movies too much. The line at the end of the book is a is a is a is repetition from the line at the end of the first chapter of the opening of the book, when mm-hmm. he's talking about how he survives the flood and the house s- spares him from the flood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's it's just a sort of. Um, you know, religious way of seeing the universe mm-hmm. as as an agent, which is which loves you and protects you, and uh-huh. and and is 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 giving and kind and merciful, and um, and even when bad things happen, it's all it's all you know in a sense part of the the plan. It's all yeah. part of the divine plan. And, and yeah, but I don't even know. It's it's like. <sighs> I don't even like because I, I I hate I hate the idea of the divine plan like that's I, that's something I I push back on like mm-hmm. the 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 worst thing you can possibly say to me when something bad happens to me is well Scott everything happens for a reason I'm like no shut up yeah. um uh, but I I do just like this idea that like look I mean think about it like we're sitting here talking to each other we live hundreds to thousands of miles away from each other. We're talking to each other about a book right now. We're talking to each other with a a dozen people that live all around the world. And we're talking about what this beautiful art meant to us. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And we're doing this all on a rock that's, that's hurtling through space, surrounded Uh by a big ball of gas that's keeping us warm. It's, Uh it's remarkable. It's like existence. Existence is insane. Yeah, and it's it's it's, it, it's it, we it's immeasurable and yeah. just like like and it's it's hard sometimes and some like, like I said there's floods there's there's death but like wow wow right yeah I, I mean I think the the a, a totally proper response to every moment of existence is is unfettered awe and gratitude yeah yeah it's just that we get used to it mm-hmm. you know because we're an animal we're kind of animal and uh, if if we just if we just stood dumbfounded b- before the beauty and infinite uh, bounty of, of what we've been given, then we would be eaten by tigers rapidly. <laughs> so, so, so we just, you know, we get used to it and yeah. we, and, and we do, yeah. and we do things and, and, you know, then we want, you know, we decided we want power. We decide power is going to make us happy mm-hmm. and we try to, yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great uh, message, I think. It is. It's beautiful. It, it, it. I. I. Man, it's. It touches me. It really does. Yeah. What a yeah. book. What a book. What a book. I like what Miss Evil Doom says. I like this ending quite a lot. This factually is not any different from walking down the street. He remembers the statues, but the statues almost don't need to be there. He brings the grandeur and kindness of the house along with him. Great. Yeah, that's the goal, right? At the end of the day, like, that's the goal. You can't. You can't live in this state of you can't live in this physical state of, of bliss constantly. Right. You need to learn to be able to take that with you. Um, and, and, and see through that perspective, even when it's just a shitty, shitty English day out (laughs) when there's snow everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, I mean, seeing the, seeing the innate beauty in a, in a, a a child Mm -hmm. is, you know, we don't, we don't need there to be a magical statue in another world to, to recognize that. And neither does he is, Mm -hmm. is the, is the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like this movie about time, Matt, which is the fourth time I'm going to bring that up on as many podcasts. There's there's a lot of callbacks, but it is kind like, I'm not going to spoil the movie, but like I could easily tie these two themes together very quickly for you if you wanted me to. I'll, I'll just have to watch the movie and then we can do an addendum to this episode. (laughs) Sure. 
All right. Um, any any other questions or comments or things that we didn't talk about that y'all wanted to talk about? Let us know. Um, I'm glad everyone seems to have really enjoyed this book. I did as well. This it, it it was a really good palate cleanser from a couple of months of books that I struggled with quite a bit. So, I, I yeah, <laughs> I kind of forgot that that was the case, but but indeed, this is um, palate cleanser is is a nice word. Yeah, what a book. Thank you, Susanna Clark. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um. Okay. Well, while. We're, 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 I don't, I set this as a low delay, but I always feel like it's way more seconds than it should be. So while that's happening, um, I am going to prepare everyone because here's, here's what happened. Uh huh. We got a tie in the vote. We got, there was a tie. There was a, de- it was dead heat between uh-huh. Flowers for Algernon and, and Harrow, 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 the Harrow, night. Harrow. Um, so, we got to make a decision here and here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make a straw poll and I'm going to, I'm going to send the link to that poll in the chat right here. I and like y'all, the way you think. and y'all are going to decide. Y'all are going to decide right now. It's yeah. up to y'all. Here Even we go. If you've already voted, you get two votes because you bothered to come to the book club. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so we'll just, we'll just, well, I mean, that's if another tie happens, then I literally have no more plan after that. So. I think I think you and I will just we'll break vote, it, and, then, yeah. and then if we disagree, <laughs> then we'll just cancel the book club. So we're just gonna leave that running as we wrap everything up here tonight. Um, so just go ahead and and, and go vote. And uh, we talked about this briefly last month, but I, I wasn't gonna do it this month because we didn't we didn't set it out at the very beginning of the month, so everyone knows. But um, we're going to start doing this every month, even if there's not a tie. Basically, basically, right now what the plan is, all of our patrons, you know, whether you come to Book Club or not, are going to get a vote in what books you want to see covered. Those of you all that are here at the time are going to basically get a second vote, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so basically what we're going to do is at the start of Book Club, during our introductory spiel, we're going to put up another poll for y'all. That poll is going to be left open the entire time we're doing book club. As we get to this part, we're going to close it. And then based on, we're going to take the votes from the Patreon. We're going to add the votes from right now together. And that's how we will determine uh, the winner. Um, So that's what we're going to do going forward. So that's a way of, of allowing everyone that maybe can't make a book club a certain month or, 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 just likes voting in polls that didn't like participating. They still get their votes, but those of y'all that show up um, also get a little bit, a little bit of a bonus. Oh, we're at 50, 50 so far, Scott. That's, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. How did that happen? That's bad. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, All right, Matt, why don't you vote? And then <laughs> I'll see which way you voted. I, I, I um I honestly I I don't know what to do here. Uh, look, okay, I really liked getting the ninth. I wanted to read Hero the Ninth anyway. So I think I just kind of want to read Hero the Ninth. I okay. Okay. You, you were going to vote for Flowers for Algernon. Um I don't know. I honestly I honestly I honestly don't know. Um I was going back and forth. So oh, thank God somebody tie broke it. It's Harrow. It's Harrow. Okay. It's <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's how we're going to do it. We're going to do this every month. And this is also, by the way, since we're going to leave it open, um, the whole, if, if you, if you have, if you come late or if you uh, have to leave early, the poll is going to be open the entire time. So if you were here at any moment during book club, you get to vote and get your second vote. And that's how we're going to do it going forward. So there we go. All right. So Excellent. next month book is going to be Harrow the Ninth. If you like participating, but for some reason, for one reason or another, missed getting in the ninth, um, you should have time to, the, neither book is like super long. So just, just read them both. Just read them both and be ready to, to talk with us next Friday. Um, 
Yeah. Not next Friday. Sorry. Friday, February 25th. That's four weeks from today. So you have four weeks to read both books or just one book. Uh, Flowers for Algernon will not be going away. That will be our runner up in next month's poll. So you will have another chance to vote on that if you really wanted that as well. Um, so, yeah, and I, I'd like to read that too. So. Yeah, I definitely will. Uh, we were talking about this. Uh, there was some some talk in the chat about Flowers for Algernon, and like um, that's a very known in pop culture story that neither Matt I, or I have ever read. So mm-hmm. we thought it would be fun to actually read it. I'm pretty sure I read the short because there was a short story that he then Keys later turned into a, a, a full novel. We read it. I don't know if you if you're American that was in the American school system. We got in like middle school, we got this big literature textbook and I don't even remember all that was in it, but there was also sometimes just like stories in it. Like you just like mm-hmm. turn to page 400, we're reading this story. Yeah. And I read Flowers for Algernon in that. I don't know if it was just the short story or if it was just like a super heavily abridged version of yeah. the novel. I think, I think we had that and it had like an abridged version of a Christmas carol Yeah. and yeah. like stuff like that. So. I don't know. I'm guessing it was an abridged version, but um, yeah. Anyway, I mean, we definitely read, didn't read a 250 page novel in in my in my middle school English class. That's right. for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So next month, Harrow the ninth, Friday, February 25th at 9:30 p.m. Be there, and of course, as always, the vote for the month after uh, will show up uh, the Monday before book club. So make sure you check Patreon for that. <clears throat> and uh i think that's gonna do it matt i think that is it thank you so much for everyone that tuned in live i hope you like our new voting system that g- gives you a little bit of extra vote or if you're not a patron you get you get a vote because the norm the other vote is just for patrons this is for anyone who's here so yeah um thank you everyone so much this was a lot of fun i, I loved this book and i loved all your input in it um i think you guys in all seriousness you guys helped me unlock a lot of the the things that i loved about this book and that's what these that's what i want these conversations to do i hope that's what these conversations do for you uh because they do it for me and i and i like it yeah yeah me too like i said at the top i hadn't really analyzed it intellectually so this was very rewarding for me yeah yeah and if you're listening sorry (laughs) if if you're listening via the audio for some reason you couldn't make it to the actual club but you just wanted to listen after the fact i hope you'll try to make it next time um it's it's a lot of fun to be here uh, our our listeners can attest to that so hope you yeah. make it absolutely if you like what we do here at doof media and you want to see more of it then please head on over to patreon.com slash doof media and consider donating a- at any available donation level you'll be able to access the vote for the books that we talk about yep. um, so that's your first vote um, and then your second vote would be just showing up <laughs> so uh, and then there's also a bunch of other cool features and, and bonus content and bonus podcasts and um me and my brother are actually releasing a, a, a basically a bonus book club discussion of uh, Neil Stevenson's novel Termination Shock on the bonus podcast feed next week. Wow. Um, so uh, so if you're a Neil Stevenson fan, you can even check that out that's, a little bit early. That's great. I love when y'all talk about Neil Stevenson, even though I, I've only read the one book we did for book club. Yeah, that's I'll, 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 I look forward to your reaction to this podcast on a book you haven't read. <laughs> All right, folks, that is going to do it for us. Thanks again. And remember, if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us about anything, you can always find us on Twitter at Doof Media at our email address, doofmedia at gmail.com or at the subreddit. That's r slash Doof Media. There will always be a thread for this book. Whatever book we're covering in any month, there'll be a thread sticky to the top. So if you have things you want to say or if if like you can't make the book club, but just have things you would like us to talk about or things you would like us to consider. Let us know. Let us know in that thread. Let us know via email. And then I'm pulling slides. I might have, oh, X so-and-so wanted me to think about this. And so maybe I can try to get a slide capturing that. This is an interactive thing. This is not a podcast. This is a community yeah. discussion that ha- that also has my face on it. Cause That's right. Why not? <laughs> All right, folks, we'll see you all next month. <laughs> um, so it's midnight, so we're probably not going to stick around. Um, we're probably yeah. going to just end it here, folks. So the, the recording is unrecorded, but uh, we're probably just going to shut it down. So thank you all, everyone, and thank you for voting. And thank you, whoever broke the tie for <laughs> Matt and I were in an existential crisis moment. So the closest, closest thing ever. Yeah, that's just so funny. Yeah. 
All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks good night. Coming. Thank you so much. How do I turn off streams? I don't.